this audience. Um, as you may have noticed, I am standing at a microphone in the aisle. We encourage you to ask questions. When you ask a question, please, please, please step to this microphone or the microphone over there um, because we are recording Beth and Natasha's demonstration. And in order for your question to be a part of that recording, you need to be at one of these microphones. Um, so even if you're in the front row, I, I know they can hear you, but the, the recording later, the audience won't be able to hear it. Um, so that's, that's official business. Um, I have to say, I am so pleased to be introducing these two women to you today. Um, it was a real pleasure to be able to reach out and invite them to come and demonstrate for you. Um, so on the right, we have ceramic artist Beth Lowe. And Beth makes work about family, culture, and language. Her good children, vessels, and sculptures garnered her fellowships from the United States Artists and the National Endowment for the Arts. She taught ceramics at the University of Montana from 1985 to 2016, and is also a children's book illustrator and professional bass player. And I have to tell you, I tracked Beth down in a bar to invite her to come and demonstrate for you today. So, yeah, big round of applause. And also, on the left, we have Natasha Smoke Santiago. Um, and Natasha comes from the same area of the country where I grew up in the Great Lakes region. And she is a Turtle Clan woman, woman of the Haudenosaunee, or People of the Longhouse, also known as the Iroquois Confederacy. Residing within the territory of the Akwazusni, she works in many mediums, including acrylics, paint, clay, and more. Natasha has been heavily influenced by her heritage, and the focal point in the arts has mainly been working with clay, creating traditional Mohawk pottery, pipe making, and sculpture. And I am so excited because I was aware of Natasha's works, and I didn't quite get to go to a bar to find her. <laughs> Um, but it, it was uh, also challenging to, to figure out how to bring her to all of you here today. So please, a big round of applause for Natasha and for Beth. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you. So I'm going to let Tasha do a little intro first and then oh you, boy. Go, you get to start. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Say go, everybody. Um, my name's Natasha uh, Smoke Santiago. I'm, like I said, from, the, like she already had mentioned, from the Akwazasne Mohawk Nation in upstate New York. Um, the reservation where I live uh, also has Ontario and Quebec, so I like to think of us as the hat of New York. Um, I'm a full-time artist. Uh, I've been a full-time artist pretty much my whole life. Um, my mom said I started painting when I was three years old. And I um, remember um, going to a lot of uh, art shows, craft shows, powwows, with my grandmother and my mom. This was back in the late 80s, early 90s, and uh, before Google Maps. So my mom was the navigator, yeah. and I was the, the little tag-along sidekick in the back of the van, and um, had a really good time with my family um, traveling, learning the ropes of the art world, seeing my grandmother share um, her work, with, which was uh, moccasin making. My grandmother's a moccasin maker, and she's 88, and she's still making her moccasins to this day. Uh, my mom did beadwork. Um, and also, um, I started doing little pieces of like artwork drawings and then selling them on my mom's table uh -huh. as a child. You'll notice on the, the slideshow, should be starting soon, but... There's quite a few photos that follow the timeline. Um, 
So, what are you going to make today, Tasha? What are um, you going to do for us? So today, I'm going to start off with a small Haudenosaunee pinch pot. And I'm um, going to show you kind of through my timeline how I learned. Okay, I'll just give you a brief intro of what I think I'm going to try to get done today. And okay. first of all, I got to say my thank yous. So thank you to Ensika, thank you to Tasha for sharing the stage with me. Oh, and um, thanks to a few people in Ensika, Chanda Zay, who's been amazing, and Julia Galloway, who got me into this mess. <laughs> and um, uh, the volunteers backstage have been great. Um, and Melissa, Melissa Zachary, who has done all the communications for us to get set up. She's been great too. And then I have an assistant who came with me from Missoula. This is Lee Sturmans. And, um, yay, Lee. And, uh, this is the kind of work he makes. So, um, you can talk to him about his own work, but he's going to make some coils for me. And what I plan to do today is do a lot of kind of very simple ceramics one level work out of clay. I'm going to make a vase. Um, most of my work has to do also do with my history and tradition um, as an Asian American. And that's not an Asian, but that's Asian American because that being on the boundary between two cultures is where I found my tribe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can I use that word? <laughs> anyway, um, so today I'm going to build a vase, and while the coils are drying, Lee's going to dry coils for me, I'll make a few plates and some of these cups, which I call Wabi Slabby cups. And um, so I just, I wanted to start with one thing really quickly. So when I make my vases, I learned a technique from um, Jeannie Quinn, who may or may not be here, about making a template for your form. So I tell my students a lot that form you can practice and you can learn and you can get better and that there is good form and bad form, even though sometimes there's a lot of fighting against good form and bad form. But um, to practice it, I learned a technique in Ceramics One that I kind of... Uh, just kind of developed a little bit, is to, to draw it on paper first. So I just want to make it look right, you know? So most of my forms are off of some kind of traditional Asian vase form. So I just kind of, oh, I'm not supposed to hold it up. I'm just supposed to kind of sketch it out and I won't talk too long, I promise. Um, no, you can keep talking all you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, I, just, I just think about where is it straight, where is it curved, where does it lift, and all this sort of good form, bad form, a lot of it has to do with we agree on good form because of what I think are three things. One is that we are all humans with similar proportions, so we are comfortable with certain proportions. Then we all live in this natural world where there is growth and the tree branches fork in certain ways and the sand and the crystal forms in certain ways. And then the last thing, which is completely unreal, is math. So, <laughs> so I think everybody knows what a sphere is, but nobody has seen a perfect sphere in this world. So we have this agreement in our sense of a parabola or a hyperbole or whatever those, hyperbola. And those, for, those kinds of relationships inform our comfort zone with what feels good, what feels heavy, what feels light, what feels out of balance. So I work on this drawing until I feel like it's pretty good. And then I, I fold this thing in half. I was going to demo cutting it out, but I don't think I need to. So cut it out and then trace it onto a piece of paper and make a form that will be my template. 
So, um, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I started a small pinch pot. This is how I learned. I'm going to set it down for a minute, though. <coughs> so, backing up my story, um, while traveling with my family, I discovered that I was an artist. Mm. My earliest memory of clay was um, the Iroquois Museum. Before they had their museum in Howes Cavern, New York, they used to have an art show. And uh, they had a children's table that had red clay. I remember it was really deep red clay. And um, I had to have been maybe four years old, five. And that was the first time I remember putting my hands in the clay. And um, I kept going back. I kept making something, and I made my dad an ashtray. I remember that. And um, just kept going there all day long. So that's my first memory of working with clay. And then later on in the 90s, the Iroquois Museum opened up. My mom, my grandmother, and I attended at their festival, their opening. And uh, Pete Jones, he's an Onondaga potter, and his son Mike were there. And they were also demonstrating their clay, much like today. And um, Mike had showed me how to do a bowl, like a Haudenosaunee-style pottery, but we used the bowl as the form. And I was probably maybe roughly around nine years old at that time. And then I soon, you know, had gotten into the paintings and kind of took off with the paintings and quickly kind of forgot about the clay. Mm. Um, it wasn't until I was about 17 years old that I rediscovered the clay. I... Um, was invited by Roger Sosegete Perkins to a summer Haudenosaunee pottery workshop. Um, we took canoes from Yellow Island, excuse me, to, from Akwesasne to Yellow Island, which is right across the St. Lawrence, up where I live. We, we dug our own clay, we cleaned our own clay. It was a whole process throughout the summertime. I want to say that we were there roughly about maybe twice a week for the whole summer. Hmm. So we learned everything. We learned how to clean the clay. We started off with small pinch pots. We worked our way up in size. We learned how to do our traditional tobacco pipes. And tobacco in my culture is very sacred. It's very... It's basically, we use it in all of our ceremonies. We give, we give thanks with it. We do all of our prayers. If you go picking medicines for yourself, you have to bring tobacco. And to me, your, a pipe is your direct connection to the creator, to Sungwayat Dizo. So it's a really special, important tool. It's sacred. And it's still used to this day in all of our ceremonies, or in, our, in private ceremonies. So that's, that's a little bit of my story. I'll continue more as we go. But um, when I took Roger's class, we ended up working with a clay similar to the color of this one. I've experimented with different types of clay, different terracottas, but I always come back to the, to the white, to the gray clay. So this was... Very simple, this is very simple pinch pot. I started off, I just made the hole, and I'm just thinning out the walls right now. Just kind of like rotating. And then at some point you're pulling the clay up with your thumb to make it higher. Just real quick, a com couple comments. So at home I have um, probably 15 or 20 forms. So I keep them after I make them, and I have my favorite ones. Um, this particular form is 
going to be kind of off of the ginger jar, which is a, I mean, Chinese forms, some of Chinese forms are really weird. They're really so uptight, you know, the ones with really skinny necks and really small feet and big S curves. But the ginger jar was used in, um, first it was, it was the first ginger jars they, they said were from the 200s BC, so the Qin Dynasty, and um, they were used for storing ginger. But then ginger became a commodity, and they started selling it to the Western world. And a lot of times it would have block letters that would say double happiness on them, and they have a little more, they're not quite, they're, they're folkier, they're more utilitarian, they're straighter, or actually they're rounded, but they, they don't have that extra S so they don't have that precious look. So I'm using this one as sort of a ginger jar, and I will do some uh, block calligraphy on it tomorrow. So tomorrow I'm going to try to do all the surface stuff. And um, I have issues with my body as I have reached longevity, which is <laughs> the polite way of saying elderly. <laughs> anyway, so I don't like, I hate the word elderly. I don't even like the word old that much, but um, there are some pluses and minuses that come from having been around for a long time. And then you always have to figure out ways to compensate. So um, I have tremor. So first of all, I took drugs today to try to eliminate the tremor. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to paint tomorrow. So that's the concept. Tomorrow I'll do surface work and we'll see how that goes. If it doesn't go well, then I'll probably do some more hand building. I also don't throw as much anymore because of my tremor. So anyway, uh, so I have lots and lots of these forms and each time I make a form, I write down on the form what the radius is that I need for that pot. Otherwise, you make a pot and it might be, the proportion might be all wrong. So I want to get to this basic form. This includes a lid. That's the form I'm looking for, so I know this is what my radius is. And then, so I've got that started here, and now I'm gonna just start making coils for a while. So, so where did you find your, what, what clay are you using now, and what do you like about it? <coughs> Excuse me. So I've been working with this uh, clay company in Syracuse for well over 10 years, maybe even more like 15 years now. And my favorite clay to work with is a uh, sculptor clay. Um, that's what I'm using today. It's a standard brand. It's mm -hmm. non-toxic. When um, you dug your own clay, did you... I mean, I, I remember reading about uh, Southwest potters and they would add mica to their clay. Did you add sand or, or no. were the deposits just well, real clean? Actually, we did. When I took the class, we had added <coughs> sand, temper, as mm -hmm. the temper. Um, some people use shells. <coughs> shells? I was told how to do that. We didn't actually... I don't think we really tried that too much. Um, <coughs> we were actually told that that was um, toxic. Oh. And the process is that you have to s cook down the shells in a fire first. Oh. And then you add the sh broken up shells. I think it just releases like toxic fumes when it's in the fire. Mm. So you just have to be careful when you're doing that. Um, so when I learned, like I said, we're, um, I don't know if it, anybody's familiar with the St. Lawrence River, but in the 1950s, the St. Lawrence Seaway came in and they changed our whole river. In the Mohawk Nation, we lived off of the river. We fished regularly all the time and it was our life sustenance besides, you know, hunting and foraging and, of course, grocery shopping. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so the Seaway came in and Unfortunately, there were a lot of factories that were that came in. There was uh, Alcoa, Reynolds, GM, Domtar, so aluminum factory, paper factory, mm -hmm. you name it, we're all downriver. And in fact, um, 
we're in the top 10 of the most polluted places in the whole world. Oh. We're a super fun, fun site, they call it. And um, so we were warned when we were digging our clay that it's really not safe to use it. There's PCBs, risk of PCBs, fluoride, and other contaminants in the clay. We're also not supposed to eat too many fish anymore. Oh. So that changed our whole life way up in Akwizasne. Um, we have beautiful clay, but I don't like to use it because it's polluted, and especially that I do pipe making, I don't want to ever make anyone sick. So the commercial clay has been the best for me. I've been using um, porcelain for about, I don't know, 30 years or something. And um, I, I use, I've gone through the New Zealand porcelain, which I love. I love the way it looks. And um, I've, but right now, I've, I've been, when, when COVID hit, I went, I, I don't want to drive to, uh, I'd have to go to Tacoma Clay Art Center over by Seattle to pick up clay. And I, d I didn't want to, I didn't want to have to do that. So I started getting the Archie Bray Growlick porcelain, which was pretty good. Um, but even all those kinds of porcelains have cracking issues. So just recently, I started uh, working with white stoneware and with, it's a clay from the Archie Bray Foundation called Mount Baker. And then I put a porcelain slip over it and it looks pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm going, okay, this might really simplify things. So, um, how, how long ago did you make that change? Christmas. Oh, Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and the pots that Lisa has, Lisa and Jason have, are white stoneware with porcelain slip over it. So I guess we should, I should label those that way. But... But I think that I do think they look pretty good, don't they look okay? <laughs> yeah, looks great. So, so um, I'm going to put one more layer of coils on, and then I'm going to make Lee start making coils. I don't use an extruder at home. I, I could, but I hate cleaning the extruder. So, <laughs> so one of the things that uh, one of my themes that I want to talk about is this longevity issue. <laughs> with the lowercase l. Um, so I've decided I don't want to do the things I don't want to do anymore. And so after, after um, so I don't want to clean an extruder. So um, you guys all know who Francis Senska is? <laughs> Somebody does. She was Rudy Audio and Pete Volkus' teacher in Montana. And I went and visited her studio once when she was probably in her 80s. And the way she would glaze is, the way she would load her kiln is she would glaze one piece and then look for a spot and stick it in the kiln and then glaze another piece and stick it in the kiln. And it took her forever to load her kiln. But I just thought, you know, I'm going to do things at a pace that... I'm not going to feel guilty about. And efficiency is no longer... Efficiency is sort of one of the potter's, uh, functional potter's issues, I think. People feel like they have to get all the handles done and, you know, they figure out how to move the clay through the studio so that it's efficient. And I don't... I, that's one thing I'm giving up, <laughs> is efficiency. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I put these coils on, and I, what I usually do when I don't have Lee <laughs> is I stick, them, stick the pot on the electric wheel and turn it slowly and set a hair dryer up and dry them. But I'm, I'm always screwing it up. You know, I'm always getting them too dry and, or, or not dry enough. And you can't quite figure out what you can get done while it's drying. So it's really... a a treat to have somebody who not only is keeps an eye on the drying, but he makes really good compressed, even coils. So, Beth, <laughs> do, you, Beth do you ever find you have any little happy mistakes? Happy that, mistakes. That, 
Yeah, uh-huh. like it just comes out better. Like you weren't anticipating that, but it's like, oh, you just kind of work with it, go I, with it. Sometimes, yeah. It sounds like you have. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I could tell you one of the worst please, ones. Uh, yeah, please do. <laughs> so I was making this one pot, and being that I live in North Country, I don't know why on earth I left it in my truck one night, mm. and it froze, and it... <laughs> cracked up the side but I I saw something in it in the design I was like that is so beautiful I couldn't do that myself if I wanted to make all those little cracks and pathways Hmm. so I just I looked at it and I kind of stared at it and it it kind of showed itself to me what it was supposed to be Um, when you pay attention to the slideshow you'll see the pot with all the cracks it's it ended up being a pot called Mother Fracker. And it, <laughs> it's about hydrofracking. And, oh. you know, I, it came up more serious, but then I have a weird sense of humor, so <laughs> I named it Mother Fracker and um, made, it a, made a statement with it. So that's how that one kind of happened. Do you have any stories, like little happy mistakes? Um... I think mostly they're bad ones. <laughs> um, Have you ever melted any kiln furniture? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do tell. <laughs> well, I, I have a better story about somebody else. So, <laughs> um, Tom Rippon, who I taught with at University of Montana before Julia, um, talked about back in the day when... Everybody was n- not completely in their right minds in the studio. Um, <laughs> uh, loaded the whole kiln with wear boards. <laughs> I-, I hope that made the recording. That was really good. Uh. <laughs> and, yeah, and so that was, that was a major kiln accident where everything just kind of stuck together. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I just, just, let me just really quickly talk technical for a second. So um, I'm, I'm going to work kind of faster. I'd like to thin these out more. I mean, as a coil maker, that's why I say these are everything I'm going to do today is, is ceramics one. Um, I'm, n- I'm, n- <laughs> I'm not a great coil builder, but I like it. I love the feel of it to to go slow and to it's sort of like knitting you just go round and round and little by little and this whole thing of making the form fit works out pretty good to me it just it, it's comforting so um I don't I'm not paying as good attention as I would if I was really in my studio. It's, this is going to be probably a little bit thick. And I'm really trying to make them thinner. And um, I have the feeling, I bet Tasha is a much better craftsperson than I am. Oh, I don't know about that. Yeah, I think that, I think that you can be a good artist in so many different ways. Um, Steve Lee, I think, is incredible an incredible artist, but his work is so clean. Um, It's a really different thing. And his hands are really good. And I think I am a little bit more about ideas and not so much about getting it absolutely right. And I'm working on that. (laughs) I want to get it a little better because I I preach good form, so I want to make it better. But things like weight, my pots are too heavy. I know they are. And I'm just, that's one of the reasons I'm going to white stonework, because I can work a little bit thinner. So anyway, I think about, I do think about indigenous potters who have done it for, their families have done it for years and years, and they just, their craftsmanship is unbelievable. Yeah. um, When I was taught, they said to never make the pot any thinner than the thickness of your pinky finger. That was just a way to remember, huh. like the thickness of the walls. Uh-huh. 
Um, so that's kind of how, how I do it. And I've tried more recently doing thinner and they're right. <laughs> so <laughs> didn't work out well for me, uh -huh. especially with um, the larger pieces were, you know, been starting to cook in them and doing a lot more with them. So of course I want it a little bit thicker. I really like the groggy clay. My clay is pretty groggy. Mm -hmm. um, this pot, the first one that you made with that sort of band around it, mm -hmm. does that have a particular use, that, that thin spot do you, for grabbing or for wrapping something? Well, this is just a miniature version of our, our larger cooking pots. Uh -huh. But our pots were not only for cooking, gathering water, food storage was a big one. And... That is something that I'm um, going to be exploring very soon. Uh, I didn't mention this yet, but I'm really excited. Um, I'm here for the Everson Museum of Art in Syracuse, and um, they're artist in resident for two years th for, through a program called Creative Rebuilds New York. Wow. They had a call out to full time artists across all of New York State. And they were looking for folks who would pair with yeah, different organizations the, the whole thing. so that uh, they could create programming for others. And so they only awarded 300 artists in the whole New York State. And I, I had approached the Everson Museum and asked them if they wanted to be my partner. So, and we got it. Wow. So really feel honored. So what does that mean? Where will you work and or what will you be? So the idea is to support the artist in growing in their art career and also um, create programming for others for the public. So I had proposed that we would do workshops, Haudenosaunee pottery workshops, basically creating more of an indigenous presence in the museum. Um, last week, I was so happy, I was so proud to have been a part of coordinating for the Onondaga Nation School for the kids to come in to the museum. They had a field trip. It was 106 participants, including the chaperones. They were there all day Friday. They did a tour of the museum. They saw a filming of a video by Roxanne Whitebean. It's called uh, Haudenosaunee Canoe Journey. And so that was really special for me to be a part of helping to facilitate them coming. I've also had um, my friend, close friend, uh, Robin Lazor, had come to the museum to teach Mohawk basketry. Mm. We use black ash splint and uh, sweetgrass, so she came and taught a workshop. We had a Mike Galbin come do porcupine quill, porcupine quill embroidery, quill work. And then we've also had a couple of uh, artist talks. So, um, but what I'm most excited about with the Everson is I had proposed that I'm going to be building some large vessels, traditional pots, and I have a friend who lives maybe like 10 minutes down the road from Syracuse in a town called Lafayette, and she has a farm. So we're gonna grow out some of our traditional heirloom seeds. Ooh. I'm a seed keeper too. Wow. And um, what I want to do, and it hasn't been done probably since the late, early 1700s, is to, to do seed keeping in our pottery. We're gonna bury it under the ground beneath the frost line, so it'll be much like a root cellar. And then we're going to revisit it again next season, dig it up, and see what survived, if it's, you know, what are the best ways to keep it. And so being that, you know, a lot of my history is by word of mouth, our, a lot of our stories and traditions, I've had to piece together a lot of my pottery and the stories that, that have, that are still surviving here and there along the way. 
Um, so we're going to try out some of those traditional methods of seed keeping, and I'm really so excited about that. I'm really looking forward to that. Are you sharing these um, traditions and techniques with non-natives? Yes. And, and, and what do you think about, are they allowed to teach themselves, teach other people, or how do you feel about that, that nasty term, um, cultural appropriation? I have mixed feelings about some of the, those <coughs> issues, but I think that um, I want to see my pottery, our pottery survive Mm -hmm. There's less than 10 of us across all Haudenosaunee territory, traditional potters, I mean. Uh, we have, you know, Ontario, Quebec, New York, a little bit of mm -hmm. territory in uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Wisconsin. There's less than 10 of us traditional potters, wow. and only two of us are women. I taught the other lady, or I helped teach her, wow. and so I like to see it grow. It's something that's been brought back from my culture. Although we still have our language, our songs, our dances, you know, a lot of our traditions, pottery is one that was retired in the late 1600s, early 1700s, when um, my ancestors encountered the, the Dutch and the French we, during the fur trade. So... Um, being that we were utilitarian people, we were, we just fell in love with the brass kettles. We, it was documented that we would trade four beaver pelts per one brass kettle. <laughs> so if you think about it, it must have been like this magic pot that didn't break, right? And you can just throw things in and go. So that's kind of where we kind of stopped making it. And you can even see that in, in some of the archaeology they find under, under the ground where, um, although I don't like it, I've seen some funerary pots uh, that were dug up, but they also started having the brass kettle with the clay pot. So you could see that time of transition influencing our, our beliefs. And the reason that our... our Funerary pots w were buried with the body is that th th they would have the tobacco and the food that was buried with the body because we believe that your journey, you're going on your journey now to spirit world. And so that the, you know, that was your sustenance inside of that pot. It was very special and very sacred. But to answer your question, sorry, I know that's Oh, like that's long. okay. I, I can go on I with stories off. for a long time. Um, I'm not really particular to limit anybody to learn into any type of, I don't agree with that. Um, I, I've had kind of concerns about teaching the, the clay pipes, but then, uh -huh. I mean, it's really up to the person, the individual, what they're going to do with it. Mm -hmm. If they want to smoke whatever they want in it, you know, that's up to them. <laughs> I don't have, it's none of my business, you know. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so if they want to make Mohawk pots and, mm -hmm. or Mohawk inspired Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's really tricky. I, I personally get really annoyed when there's too much, um, what's the word, N not letting people, like in Missoula, not letting people do a Day of the Dead ceremony because it, it's supposedly culturally appropriating from yeah. Hispanic culture and... I, I just feel like learning is more important. There, you got to weigh the, the values that are... Um, that's my personal feeling right. on it. I would rather have it live on and share. And what about cooking, you know? What, am I going to be able to teach somebody to cook Chinese or do only Chinese people get to cook Chinese <laughs> food? I, so. I actually heard an elder recently <sighs> telling a story about not being greedy uh -huh. and that if you don't share then it's just gonna die you know like a recipe yeah. or something like that you should always share and then it'll always live yeah i have a question so i'm over here on the left 
So I'm, I'm Mexican. My pottery, I also make my party inspired by the Aztecs from where I grew up. And one of the main reasons why I do that is because I want to share it. I want people to be knowledgeable on what is around them that they might not know of. So mm -hmm. I see other people that aren't Mexican mm -hmm. do, like you said, like celebrate the Day of the Dead. And I personally really enjoy it because it's able, like, like Natasha said, to keep growing and other people to become knowledgeable of it. I think that it just needs to maybe be credited. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. maybe that's the one thing, if you, you guys agree, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I think, I think you're right. I mean, I think um, <laughs> credit is always nice. Right, Beth? I think so, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I'm gonna interrupt for just a second. I mean, this issue is like really, interesting to me but now that we're celebrating a lot of cultural diversity how do we uh, manage it I guess anyway but just to kind of do a here's another technical thing so um, I've made a lot of these little trays and they're they're based on forms that I have cut or have somebody I don't do it myself I find some nice person to cut cut different shapes for me. And you can go down to the big exhibition room and there are lots of these forms, but most of them have a tapered edge. But this is a slightly different thing. And this comes from some hand-building book in the 1960s where you just, you cut out around, around the form leaving a quarter of an inch or so. And then the important thing to me is, uh, edge is super important. So. I don't like, if I were to just make a slab dish like this, the edges would look slabby. And I want them, for one thing, I want them to have more movement. And secondly, I want them to be thinner so that they speak of more fragility. And thirdly, I want them to, um, what was my third? <laughs> Can't remember now. <laughs> anyway, so w what I do is thin them out uh, by rolling a texture. It's, I guess it's to, to make a border. So I'm rolling this at an angle, which is also, I've taught this a couple times in workshops and people don't, I don't know, can you see how this is not, it's not like this, it's like this. So it's at an angle. So that I'm thinning this edge as I roll it. And I just, I just happened upon some forms that were, left over in the sculpture lab in the wood pile. And that was the first forms that I used. And then I started having some that were specifically cut. Okay, and then at home, I work right on um, MDF board. It's a really nice surface. And you need, you need a couple inches of foam to do this on, oops, but you just go like this and you set this on top and I should have pulled this a little closer and you just go <laughs> <laughs> and you have to make that noise. <laughs> I make faces. <laughs> so, so you can see the, the rim lifts. And it lifts very organically. It doesn't, it, you know, the ones that you buy, I'm not going to diss them, but the ones that you buy are very specific. And this, you get ripples and you get some interesting shapes and it's thin. So that the whole thing, the thinner the lip is, the more fragile it is and also the more fragile it looks. The more fragile it looks, the more precious it looks. So you have these different kinds of aesthetics that come with the formal technical choices that you make. So um, I'm just going to make one. I'm going to add some more coils and I'll make a couple more and I will paint on these tomorrow. And I'm going to leave these out overnight and they'll probably warp. In my studio, I let them, I cover them, you know, first with plastic and then with towel and I baby them along so they don't warp. And then finally in the kiln, 
Uh, these are, I fire to an 11 in my cone sitter, and I'm, I know I'm wearing out my elements, but I have spare elements. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they flatten in the firing. Even if they're a little bit warped, they'll flatten. And that's just something that, that's a happy accident. I didn't know that they were going to warp flat, or I was hoping that they would warp flat, but they almost consistently warp flat. So that was good. <laughs> okay, so we'll move this, and then I'll do the next coil, and then you have to bring it back. <laughs> I have a question. Um, I'm over here on your right side. Thank you so much for well, sharing of your of your techniques and, and long standing experience. I feel like I get to watch you be deft with both your hands and your words, and Thank so you. I appreciate that uh, storytelling from both yeah. of you. I have specifically a question for you, Beth. Um, I was noticing. Well, first of all, the short question a short question would be, who is Ginny Lowe? <laughs> who you get to collaborate on those lovely books. Thank you. Um, and then secondly, I'm interested by the fact that so many of your um, like designs and illustrations show up on plates and like yeah. functional wear. And like so much of my pottery also revolves around like the table and the sh mm -hmm. shared meal experiences mm -hmm. that I've had, mm -hmm. the ones that honestly make me feel more human and other meals that have made me feel less human. Um, and also as an Asian American, I feel like in my circles, sometimes we talk about the lunchbox experience, um, about like that first oh. time when you showed up at school and you're yeah. like, oh, I'm different. Yeah, so I had mine, that. I remember <laughs> mine came rather late in high school. My sister, who's also a potter, who's not here, um, but she said that she had an experience uh, opening up her thermos that our mom had lovingly packed for her mm -hmm. and someone being like, ooh, what's that strong smell? Uh -huh. um, I, had a, I had my experience in high school when I realized that I was a little different. Um, and that was when my mom had homemade meatballs that had like maybe vermicelli noodles in it. Mm -hmm. And my friend looked over, friend, uh, looked over and said, that looks like hairballs. Um, <laughs> and so... I, I'm just curious to know, like, your, your pieces have illustrations of food mm -hmm. and people and tables, yes. and they're on functional wares. Also, like, the takeout boxes are delightful, literally like a lunch, handheld lunchbox. Yes. Like, i just so curious, what are the intersections of those things? Do you have a lunchbox experience? Are you first generation, second generation Asian American? I, I call myself second generation, but there are people who use the term differently. But our whole coterie of friends, um, our parents immigrated, and we were born in the United States. We called ourselves second generation. Yeah. And, um, I grew up in the Midwest, not too far from here, and I had friends in Cincinnati. Uh, but uh, my, we grew up in um, West Lafayette, Indiana. So, um, yes, I had a lunchbox experience. Um, but I think a lot of kids, even not with an ethnic take, there's, there, there's all kinds of... That age is very judgmental and... People are looking to find people who are like them and they're looking to, at people who are different from them and they're, they're suddenly making these choices and, trying to, and there's a, a sense of value. Is this person worse than me or is this person better than me? And I think it's something that a lot of kids have had to deal with. But um, I do remember I even had a lunchbox experience in that I, I, I had a weird lunchbox. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily what was in it. Um, I think food is a big part of culture, and I think that what I figured, like what I said at the beginning, is kind of what I figured out, that I wasn't really comfortable with my parents' friends who were, um, my dad was a professor at Purdue University, and he would bring home all the Chinese students that were from China, and we would just snicker and call them FOBs you know, fresh off the boats. And I guess there's a TV series of that name also. Um, and so that wasn't my tribe. But at school, all the 
white girls. They weren't quite my tribe either, although we got along. And then I went, um, my parents started taking me to something called Chinese Family Camp. It's Midwest Chinese Family Camp, and there's, there's, um, there's a very famous Cincinnati man named uh, Uncle Liu. <laughs> and Uncle Liu was uh, a Doolittle Raider. He was one of the people that, that helped the United States in their war against the Japanese when the planes couldn't, hadn't, didn't have enough fuel to make it from the aircraft carrier back to the aircraft carrier after they dropped all their bombs on Japan, on Tokyo. So they landed, they crash landed in, in, on the mainland of China and there were a bunch of Chinese people and Uncle Liu, was one of the few people that spoke English. So he helped, he helped the people get out. So Uncle Liu and my dad were really good friends. And I forget exactly where I'm going with this, except for to say that um, their kids were my friends, the Asian Americans. I, I, and still today, I want to know, when I see an Asian American, I kind of want to know their story. And there's lots of, there's third generation and fourth generation Asian Americans. And I'm reading um, Hua Xu's memoir about being an Asian American in Berkeley. And um, I, 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 I don't know, for me, I, I could just study that endlessly. Because there's something about not belonging in either of those two places that has fueled my work. And I'm really, I'm really interested in how cultures teach each other through things like food and language and clothing and common day, everyday culture and how we all have family in common so that it kind of makes sense Little. for us to, to use that as a vehicle to, to reach commonality. I have a question for Natasha. Um, can you explain the process that you're doing right now with the long slab? And yeah. Yeah, thank you. So when I learned, they taught us the coiling method, pretty similar to what Beth is doing right now. But I guess I'm lazy. <laughs> so I <laughs> found an easier way. Um, instead of rolling it round and then doing all the extra pinching, I've uh -huh. made a slab. So it's already thinned out. It's already tall. Thank you. Um, so that's, that's, I kind of transitioned from the coil method was the way I originally learned. And then I started doing this. Um, I find it, I like it because it's like already nice and flat. Mm -hmm. I don't have to squeeze it a bunch. Plus I think I might be starting to get carpal tunnel, so I think I'm saving my wrists or something. <laughs> um, Sometimes I'll flatten my coils, just press them down, sort of they're semi-flat. And when I'm working a little bit smaller, I don't always even use this. Sometimes I'll just eyeball it, but today, just for demo purposes. And it does kind of keep the form pretty good. Hi there. I'd love to hear about what a day in your studio is like, how you plan out your work days and, um, you know, maybe things you think about while you're working or listen to, or I'd love to hear about your creative process over a day. Tasha, you want to go? Well, um, being that... I have a crazy schedule, mm -hmm. which involves running back and forth to Syracuse, because I'm not able to relocate right now. Um, I have a home studio in my kitchen, and instead of a kitchen table, I have a slab roller in the middle of a <laughs> <laughs> huge slab roller. Um, so I have a variety of techniques that I do, like you're seeing here, like all the hand-built is the more traditional. And a few years ago, I had the pleasure of being introduced to a slab roller, which was like the greatest thing in the whole world. I was like, I need one of those. 
So I like to use the slab roller as well, but like I said, I have a variety that I do the hand building and the slab rolling. So I just work at home in my home studio. Coffee is essential. <laughs> That's a regular part of my day. I have to have coffee when I get up. Have a, do you have a favorite co coffee, Beth? Do you like I, to have coffee? I love coffee, but I can't take it because of my shakes. Oh. So now I have hot water a lot. <laughs> and I uh. like hot water. It's pretty good. Um, well, I, I have I, to start my day with the coffee. So what do you, do you, um, do you try to start at a, Regular time. I'm gonna do the f another no, phone thing. In the morning, usually. Just. But sometime. I'm also a night owl. Uh, I am. I get night the owl. burn the midnight oil. You know. Sometimes, um, it just really depends. You know when inspiration strikes, right? You just go with it. I'm I'm a go with it kind of artist. I'm. A, <laughs> I guess you would say more. Kind of like make things up as I go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, uh, uh, I'm a late person. I'm a late morning person. So tomorrow, getting here at nine, I have no promises about how coherent I will be. Because <laughs> that's seven o'clock Montana time, and we just had the time change, so that's six o'clock a week ago, right? <laughs> not adjusted yet. Right? I'm not adjusted. So... I will try to be okay. <laughs> Natasha. Well, maybe I could do more talking in the morning and good plan. And you, yeah, <laughs> we could. We'll switch a room. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. I I love having a studio at home. I think it's critical to to be with ceramics to be able to just uncover something, you know, and before you go to bed or something like that. It's great. And I used to. I used to have the studio in the basement, but I have a studio on the ground floor now, and I'm so happy with that, too. So, um, in terms of my day and what, what I do in my studio, um, I'm always a little bit embarrassed to say, but I listen to sports. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big sports fan, and I got it from my mom. And she was a very noisy sports fan. And, and it was just as she grew older and I did some caretaking of her, I, we, that's what we would do. We would watch sports together. And her favorite was tennis because she thought that everybody was polite. But she, she, was, she was fine with just about any sport. Um, and then the second thing is is basketball because we were from Indiana, so that big basketball country. And I'm watching the NCAAs, men and women, <laughs> and I record it. <laughs> so that's my, my big tell all. But I also, I don't just, I take turns. So sometimes I need, I need a sports fix and sometimes I'll listen to, um, I, Oh, join Audible. I listen to a lot of books, and um, I don't listen to tons of podcasts. Podca the New Yorker. I listen to New Yorker podcasts because a lot of the New Yorker is you can listen to now, which is great because I'm get. We have a subscription, but I get so far behind on Audible. I can listen or on Autumn. It's called Autumn, um, and then I listen to music and. Uh, I, I am a musician, and I'm a, a, a horse Chanda. I'm going to make fun of Chanda. <laughs> she said I was a bass player. <laughs> so you go get the fish. <laughs> anyway, I'm a bass player, and my husband David, who's my right hand person and my support person um he's guitar piano and pedal steel and we play in a bunch of different bands and montana is a place where there the population is low enough that 
we play in a salsa band, even though we don't have anybody Hispanic, so is that cultural <laughs> appropriation? Anyway, we, we play a lot of music, and, and, but I, I don't listen to tons of music in my studio. I listen to, um, I think I listen to more spoken word, but I, sometimes I just have to hear some music, so it just depends. Um, and I was curious about the songs you, you, in your artist statement, you talked about Tasha. You talked about songs and dances from your tradition. And um, I was wondering how that played into your work or into your life growing up. Oh, let me just say one more thing. So I'm going to make a square one of these. This is, this is another found. This is a found piece. I just like it, but I'm going to do another one of these. And I have... Uh, where are all my... Here's all my all my textures, different texture rollers that I've made over the years. And this is my new favorite because I think it's sort of mid-century modern. <laughs> so, anyway, go ahead. Do you, have any, do you have any thoughts about what you listen to or music? Oh, I listen to all kinds of music. Uh-huh. Um, Spotify. Uh-huh. Um, but I also, you mentioned the traditional music. I have a lot of old music some that was barely recorded, but also um, I grew up traditional longhouse, so... Um, I, what does that mean, traditional uh, longhouse? Longhouse is the place where we go to do our religious practices, I guess. Okay. The equivalent of a church, but different. Um, we have all of our ceremonies. It's all based upon the seasons, what's going on out in nature. It's all about giving thanks. So, for instance, um, right now is the Wata ceremony season. It's, that's the maple sap, the water in the tree. Wata osis. Hmm. And so, um, before that was midwinter. That's the biggest one. That's the, the, where I feel like the most people come in. The house is packed. Mm -hmm. Sometimes four benches, four rows forward from the regular seating. So the whole house is filled up. They do the baby's naming, baby naming in the longhouse. Mm -hmm. We always give thanks. We do an opening and a closing address before we get started. We always give thanks for everything in all of nature, all the way up to the stars, from the earth, the, the bugs, the, the dirt, the earth, the wind the waters, the plants, the medicines, the trees, everything. It's always about that balance and giving thanks, being a part of it. Um, so I was born in Rochester, New York, before we moved home to Akwizasne when I was a young teen. Hmm. Uh, but being born in Rochester, we would travel to the nearby Tanawanda Seneca Reservation in Basom, New York. We have family there. In fact, all my aunts and uncles and my mother were named in the Seneca Longhouse. They all have Seneca names. Um, so I'm not Seneca, we're not Seneca, but they pretty much, uh, the Sundown family adopted the Smoke family and became very close. So it was the main longhouse that I attended Sometimes we would go to the Onondaga Longhouse, which is in Syracuse. And there's several longhouses all, all throughout our territory. But that's where they conduct. Sometimes we would have social dances, which were not ceremonial. It's for fun. Okay. And it's for everyone. We can have anybody. We can bring our friends in if we wanted to. So we have songs that are private, that are ceremonial, you know, and then we have things that we can share with everyone. So sometimes I listen to some of that, the older music. But uh, when I was a teenager, I used to play an instrument too. What's I used that? To play an electric guitar when I was a you teenager. You play electric guitar? <laughs> I was terrible. It was awful. <laughs> and That's... I used to play Smoke on Water over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think my mom probably didn't like that too much. It's funny that you, you, you chose the song that has the word smoke in it. I suppose, yeah. <laughs> Natasha, I have a question um, over here. Hi. Hi. 
Um, when you're firing those pots uh, on the PowerPoint, are they fired outside, like not in a typical kiln? Um, so, no. I, I like to do have my pots bisque fired first. Thank you. And then I do outdoor smoking. Um, I do know how to do the pit firing, but I find it it's too much loss at times for me to want to put my stuff in, in the pit firing. I've not mastered that to where I would feel comfortable putting, you know, larger items. I find the larger items are trickier and t tend to break more. Mm -hmm. And because I put so much time into them, I just prefer, you know, to do it that way. And also it's less burning less wood. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I'm kind of helping like mm -hmm. to save some of the trees. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they're bisque fired. Okay. So and, and bisque. I do like to smoke my stuff with, uh, particularly I l love cedar. And it's the cedar greens, it makes different markings than, than the pine. Mm -hmm. But you can use anything. I like to use oak leaves too, sometimes grass clippings. <laughs> Okay. Are you eating out of these functional pots? Yes. And yep, you can. they're safe to heat just on the fire or sometimes on your stove? When you have them in, in, near the fire, you don't ever want fire touching them directly because pieces will pop off, pot litting, pieces will pop off. And um, so you would want to keep it at least three inches away from some, you can move the embers close and that it'll produce a rolling boil. It's really nice. It's really beautiful to see it wow. when it's cooking. And then you have all various flavors from the earth, the smoke that, that come into the, into the clay, into the, the food. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So I actually, that's a good question. Um, Maybe, I don't know how many years ago now, but I was asked to create two large cooking pots for a indigenous food summit mm -hmm. that they have it, they, they, much like this, they have it in different places every year. And it seemed to be that they would transfer it between Iowa and Michigan. So the first time that I was asked to go, it was in Michigan. And so I had to make two pots that they were going to cook in. And um, I was really excited because I had always wondered what it was like to cook in my pots, but I was also really nervous. I didn't want to have a crowd of people watch me have a blow up or some <laughs> kind of <laughs> something disappointment, you know? So um, I went and I had done my research first and I made sure that I bought really good clay. I ended up ordering uh, micaceous clay from New Mexico. I know that uh, the Pueblos out west, I have friends out there, and they're, they swear by their mica pots that makes their beans taste really sweet. It's the best. So I went with the mica, and I also went with a raku clay body so that I, I figured, you know, if it had any type of rapid heat fluctuation that it should be able to handle it just fine. So those were the two pots that I had brought. And that was my first time cooking in them. I was paired with a Chef Arlie Dockstater. You'll see in the slideshow, there's some photos. But um, Chef Arlie Dockstater is from Oneida, Wisconsin. They paired us together because we're both Haudenosaunee. And it was funny when we were working together because the language is so similar. And I kept waiting for him to finish his sentence. But he was done. So <laughs> the Oneidas, he, they, they have a shortened version of some of the words. And he, he was always joking about how they're the only ones who whisper at the end of their sentence. Huh. So like, for instance, if I say thank you, like a big thank you, it's nyawakoa. And he would say nyawako. And I was like waiting for the end, <laughs> you know, so. Um, but yeah, we hit it off and we became really good friends. I consider him my uncle. He, we still work together quite, a, quite often. 
And um, he was, he had his own pottery made by another Haudenosaunee potter who would, he, he used glazing on our traditional pots. So essentially he was cooking in glassware. So we, when we first cooked together, he made our traditional corn mush. We used my pot and we used his pot. Side by side, same ingredients. Totally different outcome. Totally different flavor. Hmm. It was um, in his pot, which was glazed, it was very watery. The corn was very watery. Corn was the, d the dominant flavor. And then in my pot, the corn was very fluffy. I had never seen fluffy corn mush ever because <laughs> we never cooked in the clay pots. And it was, it was so good. Even, even Arlie, he was like, oh my God, you can taste the smoke and you can taste the earth. And he was pretty much drooling over it and, <laughs> you know, blown away with it. And what really showed us that the best flavor was um, the participants. They all wanted seconds out of my pot. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that, that's how um, I started cooking in the pottery. The first thing I had cooked prior to that was just the chaga tea. And then someone from uh, Mexico, I think they were from Oaxaca, they, they made a soup, but they showed me how in Mexico, they seasoned their pots, which was, they, he took the mineral, the lime, and he made it much like a okay. pancake consistency, pancake mix, and he put it in the pot and let it simmer for about an hour on the wood fire, near the wood fire, and then he dumped it out, and then we washed it, and that was how we sealed the pores in the clay with, through their way. But in our way, we used to use bear fat, to seal the pores in the clay and so that you, your vessel can hold water. And so that was our first nonstick before Teflon. <laughs> Teflon's awful, but you know, it, it works very well, the, the bare fat. Uh, and then I've cooked other items. I've made popcorn, which is really fun. We use, we use the bare fat in the popcorn. We've done soups. Uh, all different kinds of things you can cook in the clay. One of the best stories was the next time that we had gotten together for the, the food conference, um, we were in Iowa. I think Iowa was the second year, Michigan was the first year. But we were paired, we were paired together and um, we made maple sugar in one of the pots. And there was a gentleman there who is like a maple expert. And he said that we made history that day, that there's been several intellectual debates and arguments whether or not uh, native people could make, could make or did make, did or didn't make maple syrup or maple, maple sugar. They, that some people believe that we didn't have enough technology to do so. So, with the fire and a lot of love and participation, there was a lot of singing and folks coming around helping to stir. We did it very slowly around the fire. And the, the maple expert said to us, because he works with the maple all the time, he said, you had to wait till the bubbles were the size of a, the deer eye, a deer eyeball. Then you have to pull it off the fire. He said, if you go four degrees over, it'll never turn into sugar ever. Wow. So that was the telltale that we were looking for was the size of the bubbles that were happening, occurring in the, in the maple. So once that happened, we had just a, a wooden ladle and that really aerated it really nicely. It had the nice round shape that fit in the, the shape of the pot. And it was like magic happening right in front of us. We could see it starting to turn into the sugar, and then it, it had this eerie, like when you stopped stirring it, it was still kind of moving. You know, it was, it was beautiful. And so um, I never forgot that. We, he was so proud, and uh, it was in a large ballroom like this that we had our, our group dinner, and uh, his name was Kevin, the gentleman who, who was the maple expert. 
he helped facilitate it. So he told everybody before dinner that we made history that day and how happy and how proud we should be. And so when, when it was dinner time, I had, we finished just at dinner time too. I brought my pot in. Everybody had gotten one little scoop and they, they paired me next to the sous chef. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the sous chef, but I was so excited to be right next to him, scooping out of my clay, clay pot, <laughs> sharing with everyone. That's one of my favorite stories about, about cooking in the pottery. And next, it's going to be seed keeping, like I had said. And um, also at that same event, I had the pleasure of speaking with a, a gentleman who is Anishinaabe. And he said that our ancestors, of course, used to trade quite a bit on the Great Lake. And that um, the Mohawk, or the Haudenosaunee particularly, that we wanted their Labrador tea. And um, the reason that we wanted the Labrador tea from them was that we would pack it in the pots with our seeds to keep them dry, to keep insects out. And I think, you know, also as some insulation since we were burying them under the ground. So it was very important the way that we kept our seeds. We didn't have grocery stores. It was, you know, very important to keep those, all those seeds correctly and safely. And so we, we didn't have lids on the top of the pots too. So I, I, like, I think that we used leather to kind of like drape over the top. It was probably also treated with uh, lard of some sort to waterproof it, oil. And then, so once the idea would be like to drape it and then probably tie either leather or cordage. We, we used a lot of the bark cordage to tie around and that would keep any insects or rodents from, from getting into that, in addition to also having the little root cellars. Right into the longhouse, uh, there was a mudroom area where it was dug down into the ground like a root cellar, so that in the winter time, um, my ancestors, they would have access through the longhouse, um, which was a different structure than what we call longhouse today. So like the longhouses at home now are like log cabin type of buildings. Whereas a long time ago we used to live in them and they were m made out of wood and bark. So that's my long story. <laughs> it's really interesting. And it's, it's so, um, it's so rich, your, your, your culture and that you're living it and not too tainted <laughs> by Western culture. Um, so I, I was just going to, just one really quick thing. So in, I was going to say that uh, listening to Rose B. Simpson last night and the um, the performance last night of the of Napoleon and his group. There's a lot of very lofty and um, high ideals and values and words like soul and words like truth and words like beauty. And um, those are words that uh, some of us aren't as comfortable using. I think some of the uh, cultures of color maybe are more comfortable using those terms mm -hmm. and um, us in the contemporary art world have sometimes um, become more ironic in our approach and I'm, I always use humor in my own work um, and I'm, I'm always a little bit ironic but I'm, I was telling my husband David that I think um, some half Chinese and half American. I'm, I've got a lot of half-half in me. I'm a Libra, so. <laughs> but I'm, I'm also. I'm sort of like half irreverent and half reverent. <laughs> so I hope that that's, you know. I hope I can find a, a good place for 
the, that sort of blend of sincerity and irony or humor, making fun of things and also loving them at the same time. But an example of that is, um, I don't know, some of you guys have used Chinette paper plates. They're like the most expensive paper plates. They're heavier. They're, they're, you know, they're, and that term comes from China, fine China, but these are, these are the convenient Chinette things. So um, to make fun of disposable paper plates, I made a stamp in, with the font of Chinette that says, Chi not. <laughs> so, I love it. <laughs> so I'm, I made a Chi not plate with sort of the, the way paper plates have those edges. And um, that's what, so that's what this one is. And um, tomorrow when I do some surface painting, I'll talk a little bit about some of the imagery that I use to talk about the blend of cultures on, on, uh, in, in food, because they're all, they're all plates, or, or a lot of them are plates anyway. So anyway, so there's that. So there's the punch. Um, Beth, I had a question. Um, I'm in the yeah. BFA program in ceramics right now, actually with Kensuke Yamada over there. I'm oh, it's Ken. <laughs> um, oh, uh, we get Ken's asked. doing such great work. Oh, yeah. Uh, Just tremendous. <laughs> Yeah. He's teaching us good things. Arkansas. Uh, yeah. Woo. Woo pig yeah. suey or whatever they say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so in the BFA program, we get asked a lot of questions as far as like, what's the meaning of this? And like, why are you doing that? And um, I do a lot of illustrations in my work. And I feel like sometimes I don't really know why I'm doing it mm -hmm. till it's done. And so I wanted to know, like, do you plan your illustrations and you know what the meaning's going to be ahead of time? Or does that come like intuitively and it comes later after mm -hmm. a body of work is done or like how do you figure that out I guess if someone mm -hmm. walks up to you and is like why, why are you doing this <laughs> well boy we made Ken try to explain that oh, did all you? three years he was <laughs> at grad school and he would he'd just lie on the floor <laughs> <laughs> he still does that in our BFA critiques he just lays on the floor so no I'm just kidding Ken, I, I, I think the answer to that is that it depends on the type of person you are, but for me, I, I plan a lot out in advance, but that doesn't mean I always know what I'm doing. Because <laughs> there's, there's like all the steps, like what am I aiming at? Who, who's my audience? What, why am I doing it? Is this funny? Is this, um, Adam Chow asked me, we were talking about work, and he said, I don't know if this is important enough of a subject matter. So there's so many questions. But, um, and we had one graduate student who said, I just wait for one of my parts of my body to feel charged, and then I paint. <laughs> I would have had <laughs> And so there's, there's a lot of physicality in work. There's a lot of intuit, intuition. And um, like I said, there's so many ways to be an artist. And I'm analytical. I've always been analytical. And so for me, I think I have to, I have, to have lots of reasons before I do something. Like it has to, it has to be on the cusp of Asian and American, or it has to be, um, it has to have X amount of function, or I have a lot of sort of, things that before I say, yes, I'm going to do that. But then, when, when I decorate tomorrow, I'll be doing things I don't know why I'm doing them. So, I don't think... Uh, see, I'm a Libra. I didn't really answer your question. <laughs> no, you, you, I just you threw it back at you. <laughs> no, that, that's what I needed to hear. Thank okay. you. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> okay. What else? <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm looking at my slideshow, trying to see what's over there. Oh, that one I started um, Thanks. experimenting with necklaces and earrings, much like Rose. I, I really loved her, uh, everything she had to say last night. It really touched my spirit, and I relate in so many ways pretty much in every way. Um, 
I couldn't have said anything better. Like, it to just, you know, being that we're both Native and we come from a similar background, you know, we're, we were all affected by um, residential schools and mm -hmm. all of those issues that she, she mentioned last night. Um, in fact, my great-grandmother was a residential school survivor from the mush hole in, they call it the mus mush hole in Six Nations, Brantford, Ontario. My grandfather, Sherman, uh, Sherman Smoke, he attended a day school, they called it a day school, where their, where their language was essentially taken away from them. He was a Mohawk language speaker. It was his first language. And um, so by the time my grandfather, grandmother and grandfather had uh, children, they didn't think that it was a good thing to teach their children the language. Although I know a lot, I'm not fluent, and it really bothers me to know that I could have had it, it was right there, you know. Um, I, I do try to learn as much as I can when I can, but for me, um, I was very fortunate though that later on in life, my grandparents did um, kind of start focusing on uh, the cultural part of, of being Ngwe Hoi. And um, they, they really instilled it in their children, even though they didn't give them the full language. Uh, my family, they had a, a dance troupe called the Smoke Dancers. And they used to do, put on travel presentations, dance presentations. They even helped raise funds to buy the land for uh, what is now known as the Ganondagan State Historic Site in Victor, New York. And that, that place holds a lot of um, fond memories for me growing up, seeing it grow. It sounds like your community is pretty healthy. I, I mean, in some places in Montana, it's hard for um, the communities to survive and people leave leave the community a lot, the young people. Is that true in your community? Or do you think that awareness is to start to value more? Uh -huh. I think you get a mixed, mixed amount. I mean, I don't think that there's a lot of people leaving Akwizasne. Mm -hmm. There are some. But um, there's a lot that our community has to offer. We have a large community. So I think that we're good in that sense. Uh, I, have a, yeah. I have a question for Natasha. If we don't have access to bear fat, <laughs> and we have like a smoke-fired piece or raku piece or something, we want to seal it uh, mm -hmm. because maybe, w the way you seal it with bear fat or the lime, you said it's lime. It's that like one was from Mexico, and that was shared with me, and I've only done that once. Okay. So, but the bear fat, yes, is like what we, what the Haudenosaunee used to use. And, and it'll hold liquid if you do mm -hmm. that? Yeah, so, so you would, much like seasoning a cast iron pan, you know, uh -huh. you would heat it on the inside and then also some, it'll absorb through to the outside, but you could put some on the outside as well. So a, a person has told me that um, in Australia they have something called, I think it's liquid quartz, that you pour in, swirl around, and pour it out, and that seals it and it's food safe. <laughs> but I don't know whether that compares to the lime you were talking about, mixing lime, um, and pouring it in and pouring it out, and you don't know about it, that. That's what they did when they showed me with the lime. They poured it in and then they poured it out after it simmered for about an hour, probably uh -huh. to absorb in to the clay, but I've never used that okay. since. Okay. Um, but I do know that I know this isn't what you asked, but it kind of sparked when you said quartz. Um, the Mohawk particularly used to use a lot of, of like Herkimer diamonds and quartz right, mixed right in with our clay. We would break it up and I think that it had some type of uh, insulation, you know, like thermal. 
I, f I feel like it helped cook the food. There's something about it that we don't know right these, these days why, but I would like to cook with, try it and see, what, you know, what does it do? What does it help heat it better? Does it insulate it better? Does it break the food down better? Much like the mica, they say that it helps break down the hull of the bean so that it's more easily digestible. So, yeah. you know, that relationship between your food and your pot and all those things that we don't necessarily know right. how that works. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. It's so inspiring to watch both of the slide talks mm -hmm. and to see you making them at the same time is sort of wonderful. But I'm wondering if either of you would talk a little bit about um, do you ever run out of ideas or get stuck or how do you, or do ideas just roll out of you like we're seeing right now or, um, <laughs> you know, what do you do to develop new ideas? I guess I'd love to hear something about your creative process like that a little bit. Okay. <laughs> um, I, uh, I have a, I keep sketchbooks like diary and it's super important for me to have you know, just books upon books upon books. And um, a lot of times I'll go back and look in my book and see if there's something, some thread that I have forgotten about that I want to pick up. Um, I have insomnia, so sometimes in the middle of the night I think of stuff and I keep a notebook by my bed and write stuff down. But I have two quotes that like I said, I'm giving up stuff, so I'm giving up guilt a little bit, trying to give up guilt. So I have two quotes. One is from Steve Lee, who said, I only have so many ideas. And the second one is from John Buck, who is an amazing sculptor from Bozeman, Montana, or thereabouts, who said, it's gotten to the point where I, when I want to look for inspiration, I look at my own work. I look at my history. And so sometimes those are good places to get refreshed with your ideas and start working again. Um, and, you know, deadlines are always good because <laughs> they give you impetus and you're showing someplace and you go, well, I can't show the same stuff. So you, you just kind of run through stuff. But I, I just feel like... I. I usually can think of something, but sometimes it takes a while, and then you get on a roll. So my latest thing, and I can't remember if I showed slides of this or not, but my latest thing um, is I, I took a great, I've come, taken a couple of good trip, road trips, and, and that's something I want to do as I get older. I want to have time to, to go travel. And uh, we started seeing the Chinese restaurants all over western, eastern Montana. These little tiny towns that don't have anything going for it, except for they have a Chinese restaurant that's been there forever. And I think about the history of how that got there, and, um, and I, like the, I like the words, I like the advertising, I like the menu, I like the look, and I like thinking about how these guys how this Chinese family, and it's almost always a family. A lot of immigrant restaurants, I think, are run by families. And so I think about how they um, made their way and how they made friends with the populace. And I, uh, another little good bit of trivia is I found out that in the 40s, I think, they had an exclusion for there was this thing called the Chinese Exclusion Act, which uh, way back in the, in the 1880s or something that wouldn't let Chinese immigrants come to the United States because they were dirty and they stole the jobs from the miners and the workers and um, they worked hard and uh, and so they wouldn't let a certain number of Chinese people come in. They wouldn't let women come in so they wouldn't, couldn't create families. But in the 1940s, there was an exception that is now called the Lo Main exception. <laughs> and they allowed restaurants to have cooks come over. 
And this was a lot of the reason that there were a whole bunch of cooks all over the country, started lots of Chinese restaurants because they, they were allowed in, they were allowed to work. So that's a thread that I'm following and it also fits with my desire to go on road trips <laughs> and stop at Chinese restaurants. I've posted some of these on my website and I've found, I've gotten lots of people with stories about their Chinese restaurant. And I have a Chinese restaurant in my family, and it's a, it's a long story, and I don't, I, I don't think that the people involved would want me to tell the whole thing, but I will say that when I pulled the plate out of my kiln, it was broken. And I haven't had a broken pot from quartz and virgin crack or something in five years, but this pot came out broken. So I'll just leave you with that little tantalizing detail. <laughs> okay, how about you, Tasha? <laughs> well, this has nothing to do with it, but uh, <laughs> when you were, someone was asking about lunchbox experience, one f kind of funny memory that popped into my head was uh, I'm gonna do poor that it was my birthday one year, and my family had a party, and they cooked some traditional Mohawk food. <laughs> and they had friends come from all over, from school. And my grandfather, being the trickster, jokester that he is, was, he told the kids that that was skunk meat. <laughs> and nobody would eat at my party. <laughs> I think he just wanted it for himself or something. I don't know. <laughs> but I had to share that. I'm curious. We, we talked just for a minute um, before we started about the different roles of the men and women in, in your personal life, but also in the culture. And um, I always talk about my mom when I talk about my work, partly because... I took care of her for a few years before she passed away and um, because she was a, a stellar person. She was such a role model in so many different ways. But, um, and I hardly ever talk about my dad when he was a pretty cool person. But when you talk about your grandpa being the jokester, that was my dad. He was, he was the jokester in the family. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just going to step away for a minute, another technical thing. I'm going to make two kinds of pots in porcelain. I'm going to make a bowl, and I'm going to make a wabi slabby cup. And these are like, you know how there's a lot of tricks that you learn in ceramics? I've hardly invented any tricks, but I have two tricks to, to share. So um, I, I think I'll start with the bowl. So I threw this, just I tried to make a, a really good shape and uh, just bisked it, it cracked, but I glued it back together. So this is my mold. And it just by chance happens to fit really nicely over this can. <laughs> so um, so I, I've seen a couple of different ways to make bowls where you where you put a slab over a form and it's hard to, it wrinkles and stuff like that and it's kind of awkward. So I discovered um, a variant of slapping the clay over the, over the form and the, the thing that I love and discovered is, is uh, okay, so I start, I, I do weigh my clay when I'm making pottery. So I start with about a pound for this shape, and it says right there, one pound. <laughs> so you remember. And um, the trick with this little, this little bowl is to pound it out, but pound the center thinner. Because if I don't pound the center thinner, then as I try to pound the clay over the top, it stretches, and then I have cracks all over the place. So I try to make a... A kind of a, a round, flat thing. And I pound it. 
and you can see I just try to pound it thin in the middle. And I've, this is all, this is really recent. This is, I just, I just kind of figured it out probably in the last month. So I might screw it up. I'm just going to test. Maybe a little bit more. And I try to pound it, you know, you, you know how you do pie crust, you kind of push it around a little bit so that it's relatively even. But you can see it's dished, it's thinner in the middle. Okay, so then, then when I put it on here, I can, I don't have to move too much clay, but especially over the center, it's not gonna, it's not gonna crack. And I used to kind of paddle it, but now I just do it by hand. I just kind of push it. And I'm just gonna be thinning out the, the last inch or inch and a half. And this is one of the, who asked the question of, do I know what I'm doing, or, you know, do you plan it all out in advance? I don't, I don't really know. Uh, I'm not sure what these, these bowls have any specific sig significance, um, content, conceptually, but um, I have a couple of different decorating things that I do in the middle, but I sometimes call these chop bowls because they're, um, when I see, when I see the cooking shows and they start cooking, they have all the ingredients chopped up in little bowls already. So I go, when I cook, I have to like stop and chop and it's, it's really different. But, so these are, this is, this is a nice size and I have a couple different sizes of these forms. And I'm a little bit light on this. This is a little boring, <laughs> but I gotta I gotta get it so that it's over the edge. Thin it out over the edge. And hopefully, it's even. Like I said, I might screw it up. But once I have it over the edge, I'm just going to loosen it a little bit. And the bisque will keep it from sticking too much. Oh, and, and I'm using porcelain now. Whoops. So for the small work, I'll stick with the porcelain because I like the look. But my favorite thing is to use scissors to cut the edge. And it's very pleasing to cut clay with scissors. I want to try that. <laughs> and um, my friend, I do have sort of an Asian women's group uh, in Missoula. And my friend said that her, her Korean Grandmother says that scissors are the most important kitchen tool. But I like, I like that edge. I like the mark that the scissors make. And then, oh, I forgot. I'd usually, I usually texture it too. I usually texture this before I cut. But anyway. So these, these are like... Well, they, they don't have a ton to do with Chinese uh, or Asian American, except for then when I paint on them, I usually write some Chinese characters on them. But this, you know, this doesn't make tons of sense. <laughs> but it's just, you know, something. 
It's another thing to do. I have a, a, another little conversation about who's my audience. Or do you, you kind of ask that, Julia, who's the audience? So I'll probably talk about this tomorrow too, but um, there's, there's like several audiences. And one audience is, are the, the people who use the pots. People who use pots. I love, I love functional pots. Pain. And I don't do it all the time, but I, I love that you can cook in them. You know, that's amazing to me that, you've, that you can actually cook, cook in your pots. So, it's kind of scary, though. It is. I bet it is. Like, will this pot survive? But I, I, will, I want people to use my, my work. I want that interaction, not just sit on the shelf. Oops, this is different clay. So this this will just sit on here for a little while till it, well I could probably take it off and I usually I will put this on a piece up I'll, I'll put this on the foam upside down until it dries some more. Okay. I don't know why I like to pretend these are pants. <laughs> <laughs> then I turn it into a, my slab. What are you making? I'm going to make a slab for the... For the top and, part? Yeah. Oh, so you're making well, one I think slab. Well, I think I'm done with this one, but I'm mm -hmm. going to make for the bigger pot. Uh-huh. These so are starting to harden up a little, so... Uh-huh. Sorry for the pants interruption. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to the vase. I think... I made it. Hopefully I can get it done today. And I like to like kind of round out the corners a little bit. Like this. And then if I wanted to, I could just keep continuing to do this and it would turn into the rounded, a rounded coil, which is what I used to do quite a bit before I, I started building in the slabs. Thank you. So I was about 17 when I first learned, really learned the traditional style pottery. And then I didn't do anything with it for a few years until um, at an art show, there was a woman who was looking at my portfolio and she saw my clay work. She was very interested and had asked me to come teach at a local um, archaeology site called the Jeweler Site, which is in Dundee, Quebec. It's just about 15 minutes from Akwizasne. And um, I was probably 19 or 20 when she asked me. And I agreed. I was really afraid. I didn't know what I was doing, or I felt like I didn't know what I was doing. It was simply me and a bag of clay and maybe some skewers and an interpreter for the French language. <laughs> so I went, I went and um, I loved it there at the, the archeology span site. They had found a Mohawk village. They had longhouse reproductions. They had a bunch of pottery shards. I was able to study them, pull them out of the drawer and look at them. And they had an archeologist, his name was, is Michel Codu. And he is like, absolutely loves Haudenosaunee pottery. He does a lot of reproduction works, he makes his own tools, and he was actually really instrumental in teaching me all, a lot of the different designs, the meanings, mm. the tools, he gave me a lot of the tools. He actually gifted this shell to me, and I use it all the time. So when Michelle and I would get together every year, we would be like two little kids in a candy store we, I would ask him like 100 questions. And being that it's really rural out there, I'm sure he didn't get the kind of questions that I was asking too often. So that's kind of where I started really studying a lot more, the archives and 
doing a lot of reproduction work and becoming, familiarizing myself with a lot of the older designs and finding out a lot of the meanings, the symbolism, and then just kind of grew with it until I became comfortable with coming up with my own designs based off of those older designs. Then I just kept doing it every year, every year, every year. And then I um, started teaching regular workshops elsewhere, all over. And I just fell in love with pottery. I wasn't planning on becoming a potter. I just, I was a painter. Hmm. And I thought that I was going to be that kind of artist full time. But I, I, this has so much more meaning to me. That it connects to my ancestors and my family and trying to know as much, trying to learn as much as I can. I'm constantly learning everywhere I go. I meet new people and I get to hear their stories. I love to travel and we share. You know, even this tool right here. An Oneida elder gave this to me. He said it's a prized potter tool and that it's not, it's, it's a deer bone tendon, but that it's not an all deer. So that's why it's very special. And this is a common potter's tool. Did you ever study um, in any kind of academic setting, Tasha? No. No, it's all just individual. Right. That's but I, I'm very interested in now learning different various firing techniques. Mm -hmm. um, I have the wonderful opportunity right now with the Everson and I have some really great friends who have also taken me under their wing, who are also potters. Um, so I'm really grateful for that and I'm gonna try to take in as much as I can over the next couple years and, because I do, I wanna learn more, I wanna know, I wanna grow. I wanna know as much as possible. The, the largest pot that I had made, which is currently here in Cincinnati at the Weston Art Gallery. That, that one was so, that was so much work. It was very labor intense, took a long time. And it um, was very scary, but I did it. And the, my friend there that I look up to, he's a professor, potter, and uh, he said, just do it. I, I said, I heard you're the smoke master. I was hoping for some, you know, do this, do that. And he, we discussed all ideas and then finally he turned to me and he just said, just do it. And so I did. I went outside and I did it. And then several hours later he came out to check and he was like kind of confused. He's like, what's taking you so long? <laughs> <laughs> and then I showed him what I was doing and he's like, oh, okay, that makes sense. I was slowing down my smoking process so that I didn't break the pot. It was so big, 17 inches high. Oh. Um, but what I did try that day was he gave me a big scoop of uh, about the size of this, or about half of that. Uh, it was copper sulfate. And I really liked the markings that it made on the outside of the pot. So that was fun and exciting. And it was really neat to see blue and green flames. I don't know if I should have wore a respirator, mm. but. Can you talk about, can you describe your smoking process without the images? Or I don't know if they're going through or not. I just am curious how you do it. It's, uh, I mostly use, um, pine and cedar. I like to use the greens, but I'll also use uh, shaving, wood shavings, pet bedding. Pet bedding what? is a great one. Pet what? Pet bedding. Pet bedding? Yeah, like pine. Uh -huh. Wood shavings. And, and do, you, do you start the fire first, or do you put the pot down and then 
I build make the a, fire around it. A bed first with the burnables. Mm -hmm. Put the pot on. I find if you, it's better if you stand the pot upright rather than any other direction. Um, because the, I don't know, I just feel like it heats more evenly and it allows it to vent more evenly. So like if you had a pot on its side and you had it burning and then if it caught on the inside of the pot, then it would make one side of the pot hotter and then it would break hairlines, which you don't want. So if you have it standing upright, then all the heat goes up and away in an even fashion. Um, I've got a question. Um, can you talk a bit more about the symbolisms, like the mark making and their meaning? Um, I know it might be hard to describe, but yeah, um, I'd love to know like more of what those mean. Um, well, and just, yeah, if you, if you know, I know you focus more on um, Hindu, your, your culture pottery. Do you know much more about like other Canadian indigenous pottery? And if you could point towards any others. Well, there's a lot of designs and um, I'll, I'll be demonstrating some of those uh, this afternoon as well. But one of the most common design Fresh in Haudenosaunee pottery is um, the mountain okay. design. It's a lot of triangular and there's a whole bunch of lines which that's, uh, represents our growing mounds. Not only are the mountains of you know, Mohawk Valley area where we're from, um, in other Haudenosaunee territories, there's a lot of rolling hills. So that's what that, the mountain, and also our growing mounds. When we grow our corn, or you, you probably heard of the three sisters, the corn, bean, and squash, we plant them together quite often and we do them in growing mounds. So those lines represent the rows in our garden as well. Um, so you'll see like a lot of circle patterns. And I, to me, it, it's like the seeds. It means it's the, the, your seed for your garden. Um, if you look at some of the designs more symbolically, there's some designs that look like the, the sun either rising or setting, uh, it's very ge geometric symbols. Uh, we have points in our pots too, they're called castellations, that's what the archeologists call them. The archeologists also call it like a reed and ladder. There's a type that I could show later in demonstration. But it was, they, they called it that because we used reed and they thought it looked like a ladder but it was, it was really our corn. We were designing our corn on the sides of the pot. And so there are some that we don't know what they mean, but I interpret them as there's some that are the rapids, the water, and then there's some that look like arrowheads, arrows flying. So to me, that's like hunting. And then there's some that have more of a, the V patterns. And out west, they, like the Pueblos, that's like a rainstorm. And I feel like that meant the same for us too. Because if you look at the Hawaiians, that, that same mountain symbol is their mountains. So, you know, kind of universal some of the symbolism when you look at it that way in the geometric line work. Um, so yeah, I'll be, do, I'll be demonstrating some of those designs when I work on the top. And I like to um, let my pots sit a little while so that they're leather hard before I do, do any design work. And I find this clay that I have is, was pretty soft earlier, but it's starting to harden up now. So I might demonstrate on the smaller one first. Um, Thank I you. hope I answered some of your questions. But we could go through some of the tools while we're, we're talking about it here. Um, on the table here, I have quite a bit of um, variety here. I have some Various fish bones, I have fish bones. I have the really pointy fish bone. We used to use fish scales, fish jaw, jaw bone. We use the vertebrae quite a bit to make the circles. So if you look at the, got the vertebrae here, and that has the really nice circle. 
but of course we would use, use this side to stamp it. A lot of stamp work. So we have like bone tools too. Sometimes they look like bone combs, the bone that's carved, a lot of stamping, or you could have it rolling. These are bone carved tools. The deer antler, you have like, you can do your circles, you could do a little at an angle. The, the shell, we could use like the squiggly, the wavy lines, or you can turn it this way and have the, the opposite way. So this would be, this is one of my favorite, just a pen. <laughs> <laughs> a big pen, the plastic. So it's like a little smaller than the vertebrae. I like that size. So you can use anything you want. You, I've seen someone use the nail with the, the screw head. Um, but also, I like to mention these metal tools here. They're pretty special. Um, my stepfather was Dene Navajo from northern Arizona, and he was a jeweler, a silversmith. And I used to watch him make his jewelry. And um, we used to travel out west a lot, so I have, you know, a lot of, um, we have a lot of friends out west, and there's that pottery connection out there as well. But after my stepfather passed away, he had a whole bunch of the stamp tools. And in the Navajo way, they're like so special, like that they should go on in your family and, you know, keep using them. But to me, they belong to my sister, because that, that's her father. And so I asked my sister if I could borrow some of them. And she did, she let me borrow a whole bunch of them and then eventually these pieces became my most favorite. And then she, later on, she gifted these ones to me and she said they're mine. And so she has the other half and I have this half. And so I like to use the jewelry stamp sometimes on my pottery. It's a little different, but you know, you have all kinds of tools that you can use that you might not think of. The other thing that um, we used to use a long time ago is we would use cordage. This is simply a bark cordage that's twisted together. And so it could be wrapped around, uh, we would make like a paddle. Oh, here's a paddle right here. I don't use paddles a whole lot. I just kind of started that not too long ago. But just imagine like a whole bunch of these. That was the most basic pottery. The oldest style of pottery was simply paddled before we started using shells and then it became more and more intricate as time went on to the, the 1600s, early 1700s. That was the height of Haudenosaunee pottery. It was the fanciest when we retired it. Hmm. And I just bought this downstairs earlier. It's very expensive. <laughs> but I thought I'd give it a try, you know. It's a, some kind of fancy wood. And then can kind of shape the inside. I haven't tried it yet. Might try it on this one later. And I just bought this one too. I was kind of thinking like for the larger pots, you know, using that on the inside of the, the pottery. And then this is my favorite. This is my most favorite. It's all beat up looking. But this is uh, my favorite paintbrush. And I use this a lot when I do, when I make nostrils in my faces, <laughs> like on some of the pots that you see up there that are really highly detailed. I, um, this is the nose maker. <laughs> and sometimes like around the eyes too. So I'm going to make one of these cups. So this is, this is I call this a wabi slabby. Am I interrupting, Tasha? Oh no, Were you good, good. good spot? Okay. Um, so, I, I mentioned before, I have tremor, so I don't throw as much as I used to. Um, so, I've just done a lot of hand building and slab building. Coil building is wonderful. Um, so, the, But slab building, with slab building, it's really easy to get stiff and not, not uh, earthy and square and tight. 
And so I, I wanted to make, you guys all know the phrase wabi-sabi? Yes? <laughs> so I call these wabi-slabby <laughs> because I want them to be irregular and um, have movement to them. So this is like, like I was saying, I don't invent hardly any techniques, but this is one technique that I sort of invented that I think is sort of funny. So um, I roll out a long thin slab and then this is gonna be the lip. Uh, so the first thing I do is I cut it and then I, then I soften it by pressing it under the paper. And then, then I don't want I don't want a cylinder, so I'm going to cut my edges at an angle, and I'm going to cut this one um, so that the knife doesn't go straight down, but the knife goes at an angle like this so that it will overlap easier. So then I'm doing the bottom, same thing. I'm going to cut it so that so that I know that it'll be it'll. It'll, I'm cutting it at an angle. And then, like, um, I cut darts. That's, I didn't invent that, but it does help to cut darts. And I cut those, again, at an angle. And I'll just cut one in this one. Sometimes I cut two. And then, sometimes I score. Now, I'll go ahead and score, but sometimes I wait. I'll just score a little bit now score these guys and then then this is the fussy part but I'm going to roll this up and I have the paper that's just the right size for this orange juice can or close to the right size made me thirsty saying orange juice <laughs> I have these little corners cut out because I know that when I roll it up, I'm going to need that edge. So if you roll the, the paper in, then you don't get the orange juice can stuck in there. It's not going to stick. So when I get to the edge, I know I'm going to cut this again at an angle. So... I'm going to go ahead and cut that again at an angle, and then I'm going to score these bits. And um, I, I use, uh, at, in my studio, I use uh, water with a little bit of Calgon in it. And I don't know if it really works or not, but Calgon has, uh, it's like sodium silicate. It, it's a deflocculant, so theoretically it's going to make the water wetter. <laughs> I don't really know if it works, but I'm, I'm very addicted to doing that. So I just, I just keep Calgon in my studio. So this is the only slightly tricky part to get that attached and then s stretch it so that it's, it's wider at the top. And I can use the can to kind of press it. Now you can pull the can out because you got the paper inside. And then pull the paper out. And then, um, I don't have my foam here. I usually put this down on foam, but I'm going to, you got those little, that little piece. That's okay. Maybe I can do this holding it up. So I'm going to score that and score what I'm going to put it on. And I talked about my mom. So my mom was a self-taught Chinese brush painter. And one thing I learned from my mom is um, when we were little, we always had to do calligraphy. And she, she just liked to do I guess I'm not supposed to hold this up, but I'm holding it up anyway. She liked to do Chinese brush painting. So we would work in the studio together, and she would outlast me. She would get in and start painting, 
and I would be done and she'd still be in there working. And she kind of took it up as an adult, but when, you, when you've done calligraphy all your life, a lot of times you're, you have that facility with the brush. And so we'd, we'd, I'd, make her, I'd make pots and she'd decorate them. And that was a really great way to spend time with your aging mother because um, sometimes making art can be very self-absorbed and very selfish. And if I, to be able to share that with her was really exceptional and share that joy of making and share, share the joy of showing. Okay, so the brayer is a nice thing. So I'm just set that down on here. And then this is like just a mini turntable. I'm just gonna cut around that. I think that the point of doing this as a demo is that there's always new ways to work with the clay. There's, there's always something that you can invent. Whoops, that's a little bit stuck. I should have used the other side. This is, but I usually, I usually use postcard or something, you know, so that I can just turn it. So, like I said before, I've given up for Lent. I've given up efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> I don't worry about efficiency anymore. I just, I, I, I see Josh, so I have to tell the Francis Senska story again. So, Francis Senska was Rudy Audio's um, and Pete Volkus' teacher, and when I went to her studio one time, I noticed that she was loading a kiln and she, would, she welcomed us all and talked to us the whole time, but she would glaze one pot and then find a spot for it in the kiln and then go and glaze another pot and put it in the kiln and then pick up, oh, I need to glaze this piece. It was so slow, but it was just so of the moment and present and I decided that I don't, I can give up efficiency. <laughs> So, so that didn't work too well, but I think it'll work okay. So then um, I use the paddle a lot. I've, I've used the paddle a lot on thrown pieces too because I, I really like that you can control how much foot you have because I really think that the smaller the foot, the more precious the pot is and precious the pot feels. And I really like... I really like to think about how, how it all fits and how it balances in the hand and when does it feel stable and when does it feel um, sort of uh, tippy. So I, I can seal it on the inside with tools like this or sometimes with a brush. But... And I like, just like I like the fingerprints, I like the imperfections, and I just try to keep them fresh. And then I do this one extra little thing, which will help flare the pot. So this is not the cleanest edge, but it just gives it a little extra shape. And then I'll set this down, maybe on foam or maybe Maybe I'll set it and just kind of get a sense of where do I think it looks good from all sides. And then I usually have to let that sit up a little bit and then I'll adjust it a little bit, maybe paddle it a little bit more or give it a sense of the right sense of balance. But I, I like to think of those as loose, gestural, and but slab made because I can't throw as well as I used to. And, and it's, it's a challenge and it's more fun. And then I usually, because of the wabi-sabi connection with the tea ceremony, I usually illustrate it with kids drinking tea and I will illustrate it with the Chinese 
person drinking tea and the Western person drinking tea. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. Hey, Beth, I have a question for you. Uh, hi, Sean. <laughs> Um, you know, just reflecting on uh, my experience with you in undergrad, um, you uh, talked about journaling. Uh, journal about journaling? Journaling. And uh, that has become the centerpiece of my practice. Uh, uh -huh. I appreciate that um, because I'll use that for the rest of my life. And um, can you talk about a little bit of your journey with journaling and how you, how it really started with you and, you know, to now, as you said, have it right next to your bedside and stuff like that. Well, journaling for me is a visual journal. Journal. I don't write too much, but I write little bits. But I'm not, I'm not a writer. I'm not a poet. I'm not a wordsmith much. Um, although I'm always very critical of everybody's artist statements. <laughs> um, but I, I really, um, it's like as you grow, you have different ideas and you think about different things. And so when, I'll talk a lot more about content tomorrow, but when, when, when I started making pots, I was just in love with the wheel, I was in love with fire, I was in love with reduction, I was in love with copper red and Japanese aesthetic. And then um, there's a famous quote about Jack Earl where Jack Earl made pots and had a show and his brother came out and he said, well, Jack, you ain't Japanese. And I started realizing there is a little bit of like um, needing to find out who, what my relationship was with clay. So you start out just drawing shapes and drawing pots and then pretty soon it's like, well, what else can I do with it? What can I do with the form? What can I do with the surface? And after I gave birth to my son, Ty, I started working much more directly with um, drawing. And I'd always drawn, and I think I was sort of like a cartoonist, in, you know, at, in my teenage years. And so um, when I was pregnant, I didn't want to wedge clay. I didn't want to clean up. So I, for my art form, I just drew at the kitchen table and I started drawing um, a mother and son, even though I hadn't had Ty yet. So the, the journaling started with the ideas of relationship between mother and son. And then when Ty was born, I just started drawing little kids, <laughs> little Chinese kids. And what that's turned to me, so my son's 36 now, so is it okay for me to still draw little kids? But what I started realizing is that what it meant to me, it was a lot, means a lot of things, but one thing it means to me is potential and uh, morals and play and vulnerability and uh, bio autobiography. So all that drawing of, of children developed into a way of like kind of looking inward and how, how do you raise a good child? What does that mean? Um, how do you teach a child? How, how do you model for a child? And then um, as he grew older and older um, and I started taking care of my mom, I started thinking about uh, passing on from one generation to another. So this is all done in sketchbooks. So if I, I keep all my sketchbooks and there's all these ideas I'm realizing are coming from what's directly in front of me, which is my life experience. And um, as I grew older uh, and started again seeing my mother age and started facing aging myself, I started thinking more about inheritance and um, uh, legacy. And that's when some of the vase forms started to come in because they're, they're a little bit like a, some of the decorations on them have images of funerary papers on them. And so all the imagery is specific to certain time periods of my life. And then again, when Julia asked, like, what do you do when you don't have any ideas? You can kind of flip through and look at some of your, your drawings and, and 
see what you what you were thinking about at a certain time. And it's it's pretty fun. <laughs> it's nice. So I guess that's kind of where the journaling comes through. Yeah. Did that answer Thank your question? You. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So the little pots are mostly porcelain, and then I'm going to go back and try to get this vase finished so that I can decorate it tomorrow. And again, thanks to Lee for making my coils <laughs> so well. Oh, thanks. So as it gets bigger, of course, it gets a little harder to control the form. And I'm not doing a super good job today, but I just want to get it built. <laughs> and it's kind of heavy, too. It's a little bit on the thick side. Great. And amazingly enough, Lee makes them just the right length for every, every, every layer. <laughs> it's Superman. So I don't always uh, score between coils, but I do if I'm drying the coils out. And as I mentioned before, in my own studio, I'll just put the... Is that Jeannie? Hey. Hi. Hi. No, finish your thought. Um, <laughs> I, um, I'll, I'll set the, I'll, if I have to dry them out, sometimes I make two at a time so that by the time I'm finished one, I'm ready to add the, add the coil to the next one, especially if it's nice out and I can put them outside. But sometimes I set them on a wheel and set my, my uh, I usually use a hair dryer rather than a heat gun at home because it's a little bit slower and let them set up between. But this, when the, when the curve starts to go in, is when sometimes I have issues. But anyway, yeah, a question? Yeah, I have a question for Natasha. But um, first, I just want to say, I have been here since 1 o'clock, and I have not enjoyed an afternoon so much. It's just <laughs> such a pleasure watching you both and listening Thank to you. your stories. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I know how it is when you're demonstrating and you're like, oh my God, what I'm doing is so boring. It's like watching paint dry. But let me tell you, it is, it's a pleasure. Um, Natasha, I, I am also a coil builder, and you, although you're referring to yours as slabs, and I am fascinated by the technique that you use to make your, your slab coils with your folding the pants and pounding them out, and you pay such attention to the ends, and I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about that, because I just, I just squish some clay and roll it out. I don't, I don't have such a, I don't have such finesse. So I'm, I'm curious if you could talk about why, why you do it the way you do it. Well, thank you for calling it finesse. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like OCD. I just, um, my attention to detail and my obsession with, you'll see when I do my line work, I, my uncle, he gets after me when he watches me sometimes. He's like, nothing's perfect, Tosh. He's like, leave it alone. Or, you know, kind of just encouraging me to like let it be. And so, sometimes when I'm working, I try to remind myself what my uncle, his advice, you know. Sometimes I like hyper obsess over all the micro details and line work and making sure my lines are really crisp and clean and sometimes I even use my my paintbrush to go over so there's no little bits in between my line work. Uh, but that's just how I like it. I like it nice and clean and symmetrical if possible. As, as symmetrical as I can make it. Um, I wish I would have brought my pookie bottom. 
that I was um, kind of picked up from the Southwest Potter Friends. Uh, I don't know if everybody's familiar with a puki. It's spelled P-U-K-I, and it's a fired clay bottom bowl, and it'll help hold the rounded bottom shape, and so that it doesn't kind of keep, you know, weighing itself down, and then you you can keep adding on to it. It's only about like that high, so it's like a real slight bowl. I like to use those a lot ever since my friend from, she was from Picaris, kind of um, introduced me to those. She, her and I, uh, we visited at her Pueblo. She was the last micaceous potter at the time when I visited her several years ago. And um, she was amazed with how that I could keep a rounded bottom without a puki. So I miss the puki right now. This one's a little, this is, because the clay's a little soft. It's, it's still holding a bit of the shape, but it's also heavy and so it's kind of wanting to weigh down a little bit. So I'm trying not to overload this one right now. Um, I don't know if I really answered your question, but um, yeah, that's kind of how I do it. I have a comment. So Jeannie Quinn taught me how to do this a million years ago, quite a few years ago. <laughs> and uh, it, it stuck with me, and it's, it's come in really handy. And uh, so that's kind of where it comes from. She teaches at University of Colorado, Boulder. And, and then the other comment I have, when you talked about your, was it your uncle who told you to quit, quit fussing and just let it be? Yes. So my, mo my, um, my mom used to say, don't put feet on the snake. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. So that means, okay, you're done. Mm -hmm. So this clay that I use, I, I've been working it, with it for several years, and I requested that they order my favorite type. They did. But I also noticed at home, too, that the clay is different now. Whatever mix this is, it's, it's more of a whitish gray. It used to be more like a bluish gray. And I can, I can feel the difference. I know it's so slight and they're following their, wherever they're digging it out of and whatever they add to it, but um, I liked it better before. Mm. It, it worked a little bit differently for whatever reason. I don't know what it was that was in the clay, but it was more. Sometimes you forget. Better. Yeah, sometimes you forget that they're just digging it up someplace, and that the end of the vein might come, and there's other weird stuff mixed in. It's not going to be pure ball clay or pure right something or another. My uh, the Grolic porcelain uh, that I get from the Bray has been very pink and I can't figure out what that is. I don't know if that's iron or bentonite I've seen as pink sometimes. But yeah, it's, it's an issue with running, running out of materials. And yet... Your favorite. Your favorite, and, mm -hmm. and you don't want to contribute to the depletion of any of the earth, but... What are you going to do? <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a conundrum. It's just like um, they just discovered rare earth metals under my favorite hiking canyon in the Bitterroot, and they need them for your cell phone batteries. So are we going to just give up our cell phones? Or, I mean, in that particular case, I really don't want them to mine there, but... There's all these compromises with ceramics, with cobalt and lithium and copper. The copper is not as good either. My copper carbonate, which is one of my main decorating tools, is to use copper for its flashing because in oxidation, copper is one of the only things that moves in the firing. Everything else is very static. 
And so um, I use copper in every, just about every piece that I make with the porcelain. And there's something weird about the new copper. <laughs> Has anybody else found that true? Maybe, no? <laughs> yeah? Yeah, it's, it's more granular at least for one thing. It doesn't stay on, doesn't stay on bisqueware. It brushes off. And I, I don't know if it might be the same mixed in a glaze, but when I paint it on, it's, it's not so good. Okay. Isn't it nice to have somebody? <laughs> Pretty cool. Let me think, what should I make? Um, I guess some of you guys haven't seen the... How many people ha or have come in within the last hour? Most people. Okay, I'll do, I'll repeat a demo. So I, uh, I just made Lee be the person who does this stuff in between so that I can get it done in a day. But, um, so I'll make, um, I'll use this. So this is a, a plate technique that, it comes from the 60s, I think. It's, it's really old. Some weird, like, John Kenny clay book or something. I've tried to find it, but my cousin, um, she said it comes from some old clay book that she had. I like this, sitting here and hearing you oh, and wham, wham, watching wham. you. <laughs> um, Beth and I didn't get a chance to get to know one another before, so we're getting to know each other while we're mm -hmm. here on stage. Yeah, I find it really interesting and similar and different all at once. Mm -hmm. You know, like it seems like you plan out quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting here like staring at my pot, like <laughs> making it up in my head right now, like thinking about what kind of design. I'm just like, you know, shuffling through some old designs in my mind and how I want to lay that out. Okay, I have a question for you. What, um, what, what's the relationship between innovation and tradition for you personally and for the people who are followers of your work? Do you know what I mean? Like, you said, okay, and then I started figuring out designs on my own. What do you, what are your limits? What would you not do? Because it wouldn't be within tradition, or are you completely open to, to trying out things? Because I always, you know, when you're teaching in school, you're always saying, well, find your voice. What's your individuality? What do you, what do you have to say? And we don't, you know, because um, white America or whatever doesn't have a very long tradition. You know, the country's only been here for 200 some years. Um, well, I like to use our traditional tools. I like to kind of follow like this mental guideline of like how many lines we usually started off with at the top. And there was a certain kind of similarities in a lot of our pottery. Like sometimes they had various points on them. Sometimes there was four, sometimes there was two, sometimes there was eight. It just depends on the, you know, the individual who's creating the piece. But I can see, I can recognize a lot of the similarities in each one. And so I have like this kind of like guideline that I kind of work my way down towards the bottom and then Sometimes I'll start at the top, sometimes I'll start at the bottom. I'll, you know, finish on one or the other. But this is hardening up pretty good, so I'm probably going to um, start at the top. Um, 
but I guess to answer your question a little better, I do dabble with other materials. Like I like to, I'm starting to paint, uh, highlight some of the, the etch work, the designs. And then I like to seal the, the clay with a, like either a polyurethane or some type of oil-based because it makes it really rich and it absorbs in mm -hmm. and it, it doesn't look too glossy. I like to use satin. Right. I don't like high gloss right. on my pottery because I Me feel like too. it takes away. Yeah. But I also don't like the matte when, if I'm going to f put a finish on it. And that, that I usually only do if I painted it, I'll spray it. But if I, if I don't, if it's more traditional, I don't spray it at all. Mm -hmm. and so, so you wouldn't use a piece with a spray on it? You can't cook in it? No. And you no, can't. those are more like show pieces. Right. Yeah, so like um, the one that I just finished that I was talking about earlier, the large pot is more like a decorative, decorative storytelling. Mm -hmm. And that I had also kind of taken the idea of the storytelling work from out west mm -hmm. and incorporated my own, you know, Haudenosaunee, some of our teachings right on the pot. So, you know, you can find inspiration sometimes and I'm not, I don't consider myself appropriating just the idea of sharing a story onto your, onto the pottery. Mm -hmm. So I like, I like that. Sometimes I think about, um, uh, my sources of being Chinese American, and sometimes I think my source is Asian American, so I'll use Japanese or I'll use Japanese imagery or I'll use Japanese text sometimes. Um, so there's a loose boundary there too. And um, I, I like to I like to use text on my pieces, even though I know that... Uh, Sometimes it can't be understood, but I think um, one of one of the political justifications that I use for my work, <laughs> where I think I'm not just um, indulging myself totally, is that I think it's important for us to become comfortable with that which is foreign. And so if you see a language that you don't understand, it can be attractive even to not understand or just to see that there's a different way of living or a different way of speaking or that the alphabet is so different and so beautiful. Um, calligraphy certainly is beautiful, so I can just use that as a decorative element and just let it sit there. I almost always will translate it either, either in the title or on the back, but I don't always because Sometimes I just I just want it to look like something that you don't understand, and that that's good for us as culture. I think to not be so. Um, I, I think the term is uh, linguistically imperialistic. There's <laughs> there's a lot of that. Oh, everybody has to speak English. And you think about the you think about um, what languages you hear in the airport or what languages you hear. Uh, the instructions come in all these different languages. That's sort of recent. Used to be you wouldn't get the translations in other languages because English was imperialistic in a way. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. So a couple things about this plate. Um, working with found or created shapes with a, a square edge, not a tapered edge, because I want to use this foam to create the edge. So first of all, when I cut out the slab, after I cut it out, I want to press this edge down so it's thinner, so that, again, it has a lighter feel and it looks more precious, looks more fragile. So I... I made, I've made tons of different kinds of textured rollers that I can use. And when I roll it, I roll it at an angle rather than flat so that this is thinning this edge at the same time. And I've taught this technique before and people don't thin the edge. It makes a huge amount of difference in, in how it, how it uh, rises. So then I just take this 
and carefully lay it down so you're not stretching it. Oh, I got, well, I'll just do this one. And you just push it just kind of once and then you have, you have this nice lift on the edge. And it's like ceramics one, it's like so basic and so easy. But the little subtle things about thinning the edge and figuring out what kind of texture you want are really nice. And this gives it a, a frame, but when I draw on this, I like to draw over the edge of the frame so that you have the feeling of expanse rather than containment. So once again, I'll draw tomorrow, hopefully. <laughs> also for the people who came in late, so I am on drugs today. <laughs> so I have pretty serious essential tremor, which is inherited, but it's definitely gotten worse as I've gotten older. And so I, this is brand new. I just got, um, I'm trying Inderol, which is a beta blocker, which so far my hands have been better today. So I'm hoping I can paint tomorrow because I, I have done workshops where I can't even throw. My hands are shaking so much. And Tasha and I both agreed, like we're, it's very nervous making and it's probably way more the days before than now that we're up here. But yeah. It's very stressful to think about um, doing and talking in front of a very educated and interested audience and a big audience and a big room and a huge camera. <laughs> so, For sure. Yeah. I agree. So anyway, hopefully I can paint tomorrow. How are we doing? Look good. So tomorrow on this vase, I am gonna, I'm gonna sure form it down. So it's super textured right now. And I like, I like the touch of the hand, but it's maybe a bit too much. So I will end up sure forming it. Thank you. Okay, we need some more questions from you guys. <laughs> Hi, um, I have a question for Natasha. So, don't worry. Um, my name is Magdalena, and I've been really interested in the Mexican bean pots, also the Chinese gongi rice porridge pots. I've just been really drawn into cookware, but mm. I've been trying to figure out the clay to use. Um, at school at Missouri Southern uh, in Joplin, Missouri, we've been playing with flameware, but I didn't really feel connected to that clay. I wasn't sure what this clay was doing. I was just trying to use a clay that I could cook with. So I'm, I guess my question is like, what kind of clays do you use when you actually cook with the pot? And do you order one that's already made or do you mix them yourself? Like what's the process that goes with that? Um, well, I've mixed clay before, um, but like I had mentioned earlier, I don't know if you were here earlier, but being that I am from Akwizasne, the clay is very polluted and so I don't like to use the local clay. I, I order clay from Syracuse from a clay company called Clayscapes. I've been working with them for roughly 10 to 15, probably 15 or more years now. And um, I like to work with the, the white clay, any type of white clay really. Um, I feel like it, the smoke it holds the smoke much nicer than when I've worked with the terracotta. The pot that's up there right now, you could see the markings from the cedar greens. And that face that was on the last one was an old style effigy. Before we became more dimensional with our faces, it was very flat. And it reminds me of um, some of our corn husks that we use. We do use corn husk quite a bit. That one's a more of a contemporary pot, 
And that's the story of Ayanwata with his hair being combed, the snakes out of his hair. How long does your firing take? Um, well, I do a bisque firing in a kiln, so mm -hmm. it's the smoking process that takes the, you know, that I do outside that takes a while. Yeah, that's what that's, I was wondering. That's probably, well, it depends on the pieces, but at least an hour, hour and a half, sometimes more. It depends on, like the larger vessel took me all day, the one that's on display at the Weston Gallery, that one took me all afternoon to smoke that because I didn't want to break that pot. So you just did it really slowly or? Really I, slowly. <laughs> I had a, a friend who did a kind of a smoke, smoked look with his burnished pots and he, he was constantly moving around the fire, putting baffles in and it was like a dance. It was like constant for the entire firing. He would control where the flame, do you do that? Or do you just, do you kind of set it, let it go? Or do you um, smother it partly? No, I pay attention mm -hmm. and I move, you know, move around the fire and I add wood add to it more. if I need to. Or if it's getting away, if it's, the flame is getting too high, then trying to, shut that down a little, mm -hmm. cut off some of the oxygen supply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so similar, I guess. I came home recently and my son, my youngest son, he's 10, he says, Mom, you smell like you used to. <laughs> <laughs> I come home all smoky and I hadn't been smoking pots in quite a while. So it's, I guess it's nostalgic for him. So tell me about your kids. I was, you hadn't mentioned them before, so I wasn't sure if you had kids. You yeah, have I two? Have, I have three. Three? I have. Holy um, cow. I have a <laughs> daughter and two sons. Oh my My God. daughter is the oldest. And um, yeah, I don't want to say how old they are because then you know how old I am. <laughs> But my youngest is 10. Wow. So, um, but yeah, he's a little artist too. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's always loved to work with the clay. Mm -hmm. And I think, I'm hoping that he'll want to carry it on, mm -hmm. you know, in the family. Even if it's not like traditional pottery, I would like it for one of my kids to want to kind of carry it on, you know? Mm hmm does he accompany you or help you or? Oh yes. Yeah. Uh, there's a photo of him, a couple of them in the slideshow. Uh, there's one where he's helping gather the clay when I did try doing local harvesting. Uh, and then pretty much since he was a baby, like I used to put him in his height chair and when I was gonna work and I would put clay on his little tray and I'd give him some of my tools and he would get really engrossed in it and and then of course I had to make tractors and things like that <laughs> to kind of help out with him being occupied mm -hmm. during part of that work time so that was that was fun and he still asks sometimes to do clay mm -hmm. his most recent creation he made these little tiny guys little Ungohoi men, hmm. and uh, a canoe, a bow and arrow, some fish. He had a whole little, even a pipe. Hmm. The, the man had a pipe. Hmm. Do, does he speak the language? He knows some. He went to mm -hmm. one of our uh, Mohawk language immersion schools for quite some time. Mm -hmm. But I recently um, transferred him to another school on the reservation um, that he really enjoys. They have the Mohawk language there mm -hmm. as well, but it's not immersion. Mm -hmm. I think my son, you know, I, I think I grew up with a definite um, the lunchbox trauma. Who is the lunchbox girl still here? She said, did you she said, I grew up with the lunchbox trauma, so 
like when you when you realize that you're bringing some really weird food to lunch and people suddenly see you as different and you suddenly see yourself as different but um i i had quite a bit of uh anxiety about you know fitting in myself too but i think my, my i always laugh at the joke of my son um wanted to be called Thomas. He wished his name was Thomas Anderson. <laughs> and and I think I think that's the lunchbox issue, right? He wanted to he wanted to be all American kid and he wanted to fit in. And his name his name is Thai, which is uh Chinese for there's two meanings of it. One is uh peace specifically just that character can mean peace but there's also a very famous it's one of the seven famous mountains in China is Mount Tai so I was, I thought that was a good name because I wanted to reference both peace and strength um but he wanted to be Thomas Anderson <laughs> <laughs> so anyway you just you don't know how kids are going to feel about their culture and and i don't know what he picked up from me or not picked up from me it's interesting so beth i have a question about your your sculptural work that i'm seeing in some of the slides uh the carry out boxes mm -hmm. and you know uh just some of those things they and, or the the thing with the cranes and i mean the paper cranes origami thing mm -hmm. yeah so are these things cast or any of your is any of your work cast? The slip the um take out boxes are cast. Mm -hmm. But they're cast from my originals. They're not cast from real take out boxes. I I I create a a solid and then um I think both of those molds I had a friend make for me cuz I'm so bad at measuring uh -huh. <laughs> and working quickly. So, okay. So, those are cast. The origami are hand built. They're just built really thick and you let them dry to just the right amount and then carve, carve back okay. down. And the um there's some figures with speech bubbles. Those are slip cast, both the figures and the speech bubbles. And I liked, you know, back in the day when when their slip casting was not popular for quite a while when i was teaching like in the 70s and stuff like people thought slip casting was just dorky and way too commercial looking <laughs> and it's be, it's turned into be such an open field for interesting work not to mention going into digital work but um so when i used to teach teach slip casting i would only do two part molds and they would usually be really quick but i always taught a figure as a two part mold because figures are you can make them pretty simple and you can keep them from having undercuts so all my figures are just really simple two part molds that i made myself okay great thank you i had a question about the um, because you've both been making work for a long time, your relationship and inspirations that have come with your work, how that's changed and developed over time? Um, do you want me to go first? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I kind of talked about it earlier with the idea of the journal. So um, I used to make pretty straight reduction-fired pots and and i would when i when i found porcelain i brought a pot home to my dad and my dad said real improve real improve <laughs> <laughs> and so i knew i had something with the material so i started working more and more in porcelain and um uh and then so this was all sort of undergrad and early grad school and then after i got out of grad school i started making real non-objective visceral pottery with a lot of color and i don't really know what i was doing i was just responding to the material and trying to make some kind of thing that uh responded i responded to physically and internally um usually vessels but not always and then i then i um 
moved to a little town south of University of Montana. And uh, I realized I was in an ex incredibly agricultural area. So I started doing farm animals. And so I, I do respond to what I'm around or who, you know, I, I think I call it audience to a certain extent. I do respond somewhat to audience. And, um, and then, and so that opened me up to drawing literal recognizable imagery on the surface. And we um, started using more and more electric kilns as you do when you don't have a gas kiln at your, at your disposal. And then when I got pregnant um, and had a child, I didn't want to do clay at all. I just wanted to draw. And so then the drawings started morphing into images of little Chinese people. <laughs> and, and then uh, that just seemed... Uh, it's like what I was saying about finding out that I was not really Chinese or not really American. I'm Chinese-American. And so finding out that this was fertile ground for me so I could... I, there was a lot of things that I could say about being in between two cultures. And that started, that, that went on forever. So that's still kind of where I am, although I think a little bit more about um, legacy and aging in addition. I still use the little kids imagery. There's another thing. It's like when, when I started putting little kids on work, cute was pretty taboo. But if you look at a lot of work right now, there's a lot of people working with cute with the idea of cute, with the borders of what is cute, what is transgressive in cuteness. And so I think that that's something that I learned that, uh, um, it, it, you know, about, about pushing the boundaries. Or, but I don't know if that's being original or just pushing the boundaries of what you've seen, what's out there, and what, what resonates with yourself. So. Thank you. Yeah. All right, I know we could all ask questions all afternoon, but it is time to let these ladies off the hook. It is four o'clock, a little after, and um, I know we've all enjoyed this so much, and they will be back tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>